panel here on Jubes & Co. We debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, it's 3pm, I'm Martin Daubney and today I'll be presenting the programme live from a brand spanking new studio in Westminster. Isn't she a beauty? So our top, top story today, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is travelling to Italy for an immigration conference with right-wing leaders. But as Elon Musk makes a surprise appearance, I'll ask, is Rishi doing a Nick Clegg and gearing up for a Silicon Valley top job after he loses the next general election? I've slayed a dragon, says Prince Harry, as he wins an historic £140,000 privacy case against the Mirror Group. Cameron Walker will join me live in the studio to give us the very latest, and we're expecting a press conference from Piers Morgan shortly. And a body has been found in the search for missing mother of three, Gaynor Lord, police say. Theo Chikomba will be live at the scene in Norwich with all of the latest. And in a GB News exclusive, Eamon Holmes sits down with Denise Fergus, the mother of murdered toddler James Bulger, in a raw, candid interview on life after her loss and whether we should ever forgive John Venables. That's coming all in the next hour. And remember, we want to hear from you. This is your show. Please get in touch all the usual ways. GBviews at gbnews.com. I'll read out a bunch during the show. Let us know especially what you think about this magnificent new studio. It's the first show from here. I feel honoured to be here. What could possibly go wrong? Now, here's your latest news headlines with Lisa Hartle. Good afternoon. It's just after three o'clock. I'm Lisa Hartle in the GB Newsroom. Police say there is no evidence of third-party involvement after a body was found in a river during the search for a missing mother of three in Norwich. Gaynor Lord went missing after leaving work in Norwich city centre last Friday. Norfolk police say the body hasn't been formally identified. The force says it remains open-minded to the circumstances of the 55-year-old's disappearance and will continue to pursue all lines of inquiry. This remains a missing person inquiry at this stage. I'm also satisfied at the moment, based on the evidence that we have, that Gaynor did not meet anybody on the way to the park, and we now have a better understanding of her movements through the city centre. Whilst this is not the outcome we wished for, our search is always predominantly focused on the river and the park. Prince Harry says it's a great day for truth and accountability after being awarded more than £140,000 in damages over phone hacking claims against a tabloid newspaper group. The High Court ruled there was extensive phone hacking by the Mirror Group newspapers between 2006 and 2011. The judge also said the Duke of Sussex's phone was probably hacked to a modest extent. In response, the publisher says they apologise unreservedly where historical wrongdoing took place. Prince Harry's lawyer, David Sherborne, read out this statement earlier. This case is not just about hacking. 
It is about a systemic practice of unlawful and appalling behaviour, followed by cover-ups and destruction of evidence, the shocking scale of which can only be revealed through these proceedings. The Court has found that Mirror Group's principal board directors, their legal department, senior executives and editors such as Piers Morgan clearly knew about or were involved in these illegal activities. The Home Secretary says the government must and will do more after one person died and another was left in a critical condition in the English Channel. A boat carrying migrants sank about five miles off the coast of Dunkirk overnight. More than 60 people were rescued. James Cleverly described the incident as a horrific reminder of the people smugglers' brutality. UK police are working with French authorities to bring back a British schoolboy who went missing six years ago. Alex Batty, who is now 17, went missing in 2017 after going on a family holiday to Spain. Detectives believe he was abducted by his mother to live an alternative lifestyle abroad. Assistant Chief Constable from Greater Manchester Police Chris Sykes gave this update earlier. A warning, this contains flashing images. Our main priority now is to see Alex return home to his family in the UK and our investigation team are working around the clock with partner agencies and the French authorities to ensure they are all fully supported. Alex and his family remain our focus and we still have some work to do in establishing the full circumstances surrounding his disappearance and where he has been in all those years. Relatives of two people killed at a London music venue have renewed their appeal for information one year on from a fatal crush. 23-year-old security guard Gabby Hutchinson and 33-year-old Rebecca IQ Mello were killed when fans without tickets tried to force their way into the Brixton Academy last year. The Met had recently released CCTV images of people they wished to speak to about the incident and confirmed one arrest had been made. The parents of Rebecca say they want justice. But we don't know what happened to her. We don't know how how um, she died. And we're, we're, we're still waiting for, for information um, as to how this happened. And um, I mean, the most important thing is um, we don't want this to happen to another family. This is GB News across the UK on TV, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. Now it's back to Martin. Thank you very much, Lisa. Now we start with the latest on the migrant crisis, the ongoing saga. And I told you yesterday that Rishi Sunak will meet Italian Prime Minister Giorgio Maloney tomorrow. But in a major development, it's emerged that the leader of Albania will also be present. Now I'm joined in our new studio in Westminster by our political editor, Christopher Hope. Chris, this seems to be significant. Maloney has a deal with Albania. We have a deal with Albania. Maloney is doing an offshore containment deal to stop the boat in Albania. Rishi's going to be there. Sounds like a great idea. Why can't we have a bit of that? There's common cause, isn't there? I mean, the idea of the offshore offshore uh, processing centres is what Germany are looking at in other countries. Rwanda's different. Rwanda, our idea of Rwanda is a deportation idea, and that's why mm. Labour's so against it. But the idea of processing illegally arrived migrants somewhere else not in hotels, and not allowed to wait in hotels while they're processed, is, is not a bad idea. I mean, the, the appeal, if you want to get to the UK and go into a hotel, it, it almost sort of draws them in, and mm. it shouldn't be doing. There should be a degree of don't come here at all. Begs the question, if it was so quick and easy for Maloney to set up this deal with Albania, we have done our own returns deal with Albania recently, of course, one of the successes of Sunak's premiership, um, declared a safe country, which, of course, it is. Mm. But why can't we do an identical deal with Albania? Albania, rather than you know, they're wasting all the time of the human rights of Rwanda, it's, it's off the peg, it's ready to go. Why don't we just do the same? We could try to, but we are trying to do a different idea. We're trying to really properly uh, dissuade people from coming here. If you know that if you cross the channel, you'll go 5,000 miles away to Rwanda, not if... to Albania, where there's a different, an easier route back to the UK. But they're building containment centres, ostensibly manned security, you know, 
prisons, basically. They're processing centres. And that's the sort of place I think would be quite a good deterrent if you're landing, mm. if you're rocking up in a dinghy at Dover, then you go to Albania and be in a prison. That, that's... We do have an Albania deal, of course. The, 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 they, they, the PM tells us that's cut numbers by 30% in crossings. Some would say the weather had a part to play yeah. in that. We had a dreadful summer here, didn't we? But, but the idea of Rwanda is something completely different. It's meant to try and uh, break once and for all the even attraction of coming here, things start getting flights taken off. When it started out, though, <clears throat> it was a few hundred um, young men would be sent, yep. and now it's become this, this silver bullet. I think it's almost got it's, it's got this totemic uh, attraction now. I think for many in the Tory Party, but beyond what it can do. Now my eyebrows raised when I saw Elon Musk is turning up. Something of a big tech bromance, it seems, going on between Rishi and Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. um, they're getting quite tight. A lot of people looking ahead, speculating <laughs> that Rishi Sunak fancies himself in Silicon Valley, <laughs> a sort of Nick Clegg on steroids, maybe <laughs> down the line. Is this Rishi with one eye on his next career move? A grossly cynical, Martin, to think <laughs> that. There's an, not an election for at least a year, probably. Probably about a year away is the election. Yes, he's got a house in California. Yes, that's where Elon Musk is based, his Tesla operation, uh, Twitter AI, of course, the big growth area. He, of course, he met with Elon Musk, didn't he? At that, uh, that session they had on AI mm. um, uh, in Buckinghamshire. I mean, they, yes, they, there was clearly a connection. And I think, I think frankly, you, you could be right, but I think, I think, to be fair to Sunak, he probably thinks AI is the future. We're trying to be almost a global regulator for AI. We're trying to be the place where AI is settled and, and the, the, the guardrails mm. are worked out. And it's all part of that, more than, more than him planning for the future, Martin. You are cynical, you know. Well, I think there's something in it. I really do. <laughs> um, look, look, if you put yourself at the centre of an AI movement, a political movement, Elon Musk is in control of the tech. Rishi's a great intro man, far better than Nick Clegg, some might say. Call me cynic, I'm just laying it out there. <laughs> Chris Vogt, thank you, superb. Kicking off our maiden session Absolutely. in the new studio. Great to be here. Long may there be many, many more. Now, I'm joined on the line by political commentator Paolo Diana. Paolo, it's always a pleasure to see you on the show. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, so we, Martin. We Thank have um, Rishi Sunak um, with your Premier, Giorgio Maloney. Maloney, of course, has done a fantastic deal, I would say, with Albania. Offshore containment, a way that's really going to stop the boats. Begs the question, how did that go down in Italy? Because we have such resistance in Britain to Rwanda. How did the Italian public react to that deal? Well, Martin, there wasn't so much resistance at all. The Democratic Party says something, but it was more rhetoric than anything else. And they stopped talking about that. Uh, I read Italian newspapers every day and there's no mention about it. No scandal, uh, not only in Italy, but also in the European Union. Because we all know that the European Commission gave uh, uh, permission to Giorgio Meloni to go on with this uh, um, agreement with Albania. It just, I find it astonishing that this deal was done very quickly and Italy, last time I checked, is in the European Union and in the, the ECHR, yet you haven't, you've had no resistance, the lawyers haven't complained, the media haven't complained and yet we find ourselves in the UK unable to get a single person to Rwanda. What do you think Rishi Sunak can learn from Giorgio Maloney in his time in Italy? I know. It's a problem, I think, for far-left uh, wing press that is demonizing and polarizing the public opinion uh, related to immigration. I think um, Rishi Sunak is doing well and he could just implement this idea. I think uh, striking deals with other countries uh, and uh, getting help in processing the visas, uh, these you know, illegal migrants, uh, to see if they're real refugees or not, uh, in other countries is just the way forward. We know that Denmark is looking into that, and also Germany. If Germany in the future will be um, ruled by a centre-right uh, government, that it looks like it might happen in a few years' time, uh, they will follow. We, we all know that, unfortunately, immigration is going to rise, illegal immigration. And how popular has this been with the Italian public? Because, again, the press in Britain, the liberal media in Britain, has called her a far-right extremist, drags out links to Mussolini. But I'm assuming this has landed very well with most of the Italian public because it's a very visible, a very present and a very um, touchable phenomenon of all these boats constantly coming in in far greater numbers to Italy than they do to the UK. 
Absolutely. But I tell you the truth, Martin, uh, Georgia Meloni, she's running a moderate uh, government. Uh, she's not her right. This is completely misleading. Uh, everything that I read uh, in, in the press, particularly in certain press uh, here in the UK, and uh, everyone is scared about the future because we all know that uh, uh, illegal migrants uh, will be a burden, are a burden for a nation. And also we have to look into who we, these migrants are. You know that 99% of these migrants are young men coming from poor countries, so they are not educated, they don't have money. Someone has to pay for their education, for them to find jobs. It's not easy. Uh, we know that Italy already has other problems by its own. So we can't save all the poor people in the planet, uh, even okay. wish we could. Diana, I'm afraid we have to interrupt you there. We are now going to Piers Morgan. Is making a statement judge in the High Court Harry in London Cole. has ruled on various cases, including Prince Harry's claim against Mirror Group newspapers, where I was an editor until 2004. The judgment finds there is just one article relating to the prince, published in the Daily Mirror during my entire nine-year tenure as editor, that he thinks may have involved some unlawful information gathering. To be clear, I had then, and still have, zero knowledge of how that particular story was gathered. All his other claims against the Daily Mirror, under my leadership, were rejected. With regard to the judge's other references to me in his judgment, I also want to reiterate, as I've consistently said for many years now, I've never hacked a phone or told anybody else to hack a phone. And nobody has produced any actual evidence to prove that I did. I wasn't called as a witness, and it's important for people to know this, by either side in the case, nor was I asked to provide any statement. I would have very happily agreed to do either or both of those things had I been asked. Nor did I have a single conversation with any of the Mirror Group lawyers throughout the entire legal process. So, I wasn't able to respond to the many false allegations that were spewed about me in court by all foes of mine with an axe to grind most of which, inexplicably, were not even challenged in my absence by the Mirror Group Council. But I note the judge appears to have believed the evidence of Omid Scobie, who lied about me in his new book, and he lied about me in court, and the whole world now knows him to be a deluded fantasist. And he believed the evidence of Alistair Campbell, another proven liar who spun this country into an illegal war. Finally, I want to say this. Prince Harry's outrage at media intrusion into the private lives of the royal family is only matched by his own ruthless, greedy and hypocritical enthusiasm for doing it himself. He talked today about the appalling behaviour of the press. But this is a guy who's repeatedly trashed his family in public for hundreds of millions of dollars, even as two of its most senior and respected members were dying, his grandparents. It's hard to imagine, frankly, more appalling behaviour than that. As for him saying this is a good day for truth, the Duke has been repeatedly exposed in recent years as someone who wouldn't know the truth if it slapped him around his California tanned face. He demands accountability for the press, but refuses to accept any for himself for smearing the royal family, his own family, as a bunch of callous racists without producing a shred of proof to support those disgraceful claims. He also says he's on a mission to reform the media when it's become clear his real mission, along with his wife, is to destroy the British monarchy. And I will continue to do whatever I can to stop them. You look very Merry emotional, uh, Mr Morgan. Has this been difficult for you? Would you welcome a police investigation? Are you worried about oh. being convicted? Absolutely astonishing comments there. Piers Morgan really on a front foot. We'll have much more on that Prince Harry's High Court case in a few minutes, and we'll have a full analysis of what Piers Morgan just said, coming out swinging in that statement to the press there. OK, and there's plenty of coverage on our website, gbnews.com. You've helped to make it the fastest growing national news website in the country. So thank you very much for that. Now, you can start your new year with £10,000 in cash, a 500 quid shopping spree and a brand new iPhone. Sounds amazing, right? Well, here's how you could make all of those prizes yours. This is your chance to win cash, treats and tech in our very first Great British Giveaway. There's a totally tax-free £10,000 cash up for grabs. Cash, which would help make 2024 a whole lot better. We're also going to send you shopping with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. What would be on your shopping list? If it's a new iPhone, we've also got that covered too with the latest iPhone 15 Pro Max, which you'll also receive. For your chance to win the iPhone, the vouchers and £10,000 cash, 
Text GB Wind to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB01, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 5th of January. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Good luck. And the, there's a rare bit of good news for Prince Harry today. And God knows he needs it. He's been awarded more than £140,000 after his phone hacking case against Mirror Group newspapers. A raw reporter will be with me soon. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Who is it? We're here for the show. <laughs> Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 3.22. You're watching or listening to me, Martin Daubney, on GB News. Now, later this hour, I'll bring you an exclusive interview with Denise Fergus, the mother, of course, of James Bulger, after one of her son's killers was denied parole. 
Now, Prince Harry has been awarded more than £140,000 in damages after a phone hacking case. The Duke of Sussex took the action against Mirror Group newspapers. He says it's a great day for truth as well as accountability. And I'm joined in the studio by our royal correspondent, Cameron Walker. Cameron, we, we have to start with that, frankly, blistering speech that um, Piers Morgan just gave in reaction to earlier claims. If we thought Piers was going to be meek and mild... That didn't happen. Absolutely. So just to recap, the judge in uh, Prince Harry's case against Mirror Group newspaper ruled that uh, Piers Morgan knew about phone hacking. Well, Piers Morgan, in a very strongly worded statement outside his house mm. in London, uh, fought back, I think is a good way to describe it. Uh, he, sp he absolutely denies any knowledge um, of yeah. phone hacking uh, in, in, that, in any of the articles written about in this, uh, this litigation against new, uh, Mirror Group newspapers. He says he has never hacked a phone. He's never instructed anyone to do so either. But then he went on the attack. He, he attacked Omid Scobie, Prince Harry's uh, unofficial biographer, let's say, uh, saying that he lied about mm. him, as in Piers, uh, in his new book called Endgame. He also went on to the attack um, of Alistair Campbell, mm. accusing him of being a proven liar. Uh, and then he went on the attack um, about Prince Harry mm. himself, saying uh, that Harry is outrageous. He spoke of the fact how outrageous it was that he was talking and criticising about the royal family as Prince Philip and the late Queen were dying. So really strong words there uh, from Piers Morgan, former editor of the Daily Mirror. Yeah, and he rounded off by saying Prince Harry claims his mission is to reform the press. I thought the most blistering line was the finale. His real mission is to destroy the royal family. So if we thought Piers Morgan was going to come out and try and placate matters, try and put the fire out... That's the opposite of what happened. This has revved things up once again, Cameron. Absolutely, and it's going to be really interesting to see where all the different authorities go from here. Prince Harry, in his statements delivered via his lawyer, David Sherborne, outside the court earlier on, um, called upon the Metropolitan Police and prosecuting authorities to A, investigate, B, uh, bring charges against the company and those who he thinks have broken the law. Now, I have asked the Metropolitan Police for a statement following the Duke of Sussex. At the moment, the answer is no comments, but of course, uh, never say never. Mirror Group newspapers have responded themselves. A spokesperson says that they apologise unreservedly uh, for the historical wrongdoing to Prince Harry and the other high-profile figures in this case. Just to recap, Prince Harry, uh, 15 of the 33 articles tested in this case, the judge has ruled... Harry is a victim of unlawful information gathering, including phone hacking, uh, blagging or, or so-called uh, deceiving to get information mm. and to be used to private investigators. He's been awarded £140,600 in damages. And a lot of those stories, Cameron, were of a very, very personal nature, particularly about Harry's drug-taking, his partying, his personal life. You can understand, to be fair, why, why Harry would feel pretty aggrieved by stories <clears> of that nature, particularly around the drug-taking and his international travel, his royal status. You can understand and why you'll take objection to them. Yeah, absolutely. And I was inside the courtroom when Prince Harry was giving his evidence and he was clearly upset at times, having to talk about very personal moments uh, in his life. These articles do talk about his private life. He talks about the alleged drug use, of course, uh, but also his relationships with his family, his yeah. brother Prince William, and ex-girlfriend Ch Chelsea Davy. He partly blames the press uh, for the breakdown in that relationship yeah. with his former girlfriend Chelsea Davy. So he's clearly very angry, but this is just the start of, I think, of a long battle for Prince Harry. Yes, he's partly won his, um, his his case against Mirror Group newspapers, but he still has a number of other civil cases against other newspaper publishers to go. Associated Newspapers, publisher of the Daily Mail, and News Group newspapers, publisher of The Sun and the now defunct News of the World. Mm. He, he accuses them as well of unlawful information gathering. Both publications deny those allegations, but the trials are going to happen next year and the year after. It was a good news day for a while for Prince Harry. Um, he, he was victorious, I slayed a dragon, and now um, this riposte, this retort, this, this fire across the bow from Piers Morgan, that changes things. 
Well, I think it's certainly a battle which Prince uh, Harry and Piers Morgan are not going to uh, back down to. If you remember, Prince uh, Piers Morgan was forced to step back from his role at ITV's Good Morning Britain following that Oprah interview where Meghan mm. accused an unnamed member of the royal family of questioning what colour Archie's skin would be when he was born. Piers Morgan publicly said he did not believe anything Meghan said during that Oprah interview uh, event. He refused to apologise and, and, and he, he left ITV. Then, of course, we get to Omid Scobie's book, where mm. these two so-called royal racists uh, are, are named in the book, and Prince Harry, uh, sorry, Piers Morgan goes on the attack um, of Omid Scobie as well. So mm. it's all very messy and a lot more battles to come, I fear. Yeah, super. Thanks for a great update. As ever, Cameron Walker in our brand-new studio in Westminster. Now, specialist divers searching for missing mother of three, Gaynor Lord, have found a body in the River Wensum in Norwich. And let's speak now to our national reporter, Theo Chacomba, for a full update of the latest. Theo, what's the latest that's going on there? Quite harrowing breakthrough now. Yes, indeed. Well, in the last hour, we heard from Superintendent, uh, the Chief uh, here, uh, David Buckley, who gave an update to the press in the last hour, uh, confirming that this remains a missing persons inquiry and that Gaynor did not meet anyone on the way to this area, but the cause of death is still yet to be confirmed of the body that they have found, although they haven't uh, given any formal identification at the moment. And as we've seen in the last few days, the focus has been the path that she took on the way to this area. And of course, this park, Wensum Park, the river just behind me on my right shoulder is where we've seen the diving teams uh, going into the water from in the morning into the evening for the last couple of days. And today they made their way around 200 meters in this, in that direction to my right, uh, which heads towards the city center. And there they found a body and confirmed that just after midday today and they're saying a post-mortem is going to take place and that there's no evidence of third party involvement and just following that press conference this afternoon saw some members of the public who were here to lay flowers as well and we heard from Leslie McCauley a, a local resident and this is what she had to say yes it still feels the same um yeah, it's just all devastating and I just wish and wish that she was going to be found safe, safe, yeah. It's a very sad day. And I just wanted to come and lay some flowers because it's been there with me in my heart since Friday, as you can imagine. That's all we need, thank you. All right. For members of the community in this area, they've been keeping their eyes on what's been happening for the last few days. This entire park has been closed off to members of the public and it remains the case uh, for now. Police presence is still here and they're saying they're going to continue uh, searching for anything that might help them as part of their in investigation. But for now, though, uh, the police say it remains a missing persons inquiry. Thank you for that update, Theo Chagomba, live in Norwich. Now, we've got lots more on the way between now and four o'clock, and there's a warning that Brits are facing a heightened risk after a Hamas plot to murder Jews in Europe was disrupted by European police. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Lisa Hartle. It's just after half three. I'm Lisa Hartle in the GB Newsroom. Prince Harry says it's a great day for truth and accountability after being awarded more than £140,000 in damages over phone hacking claims against a tabloid newspaper group. The High Court ruled there was extensive phone hacking by the Mirror Group newspapers between 2006 and 2011. In response, the publisher says they apologise unreservedly where historical wrongdoing took place. The judge also said journalists were involved in phone hacking whilst Piers Morgan worked at the Daily Mirror. But the former editor claims he has never hacked a phone or told anyone else to hack a phone. As for him saying this is a good day for truth, the Duke has been repeatedly exposed in recent years as someone who wouldn't know the truth if it slapped him around his California tanned face. He demands accountability for the press, but refuses to accept any for himself for smearing the royal family, his own family, as a bunch of callous racists without producing a shred of proof to support those disgraceful claims. 
A uh, British schoolboy who went missing six years ago in France should be able to return to his family in the UK tomorrow. That's according to French officials who've been working with UK police on the situation. Alex Batty, who is now 17, went missing in 2017 after going on a family holiday to Spain. Detectives believe he was abducted by his mother to leave an alternative lifestyle abroad. Police say there is no evidence of third-party involvement after a body was found in a river during the search for a missing mother of three in Norwich. Gaynor Lord went missing after leaving work in Norwich city centre last Friday. Norfolk police say the body hasn't been formally identified. The force says it remains open-minded to the circumstances of the 55-year-old's disappearance and will continue to pursue all lines of inquiry. You can get more on all of those stories by visiting our website, gbnews.com. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2716 and €1.1645. Euros. The price of gold is £1,603.15 per ounce and the FTSE 100 at 7,578 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Now, a migrant has died and another is in a critical condition after a boat sank in the Channel. The French Coast Guard was alerted to a boat with more than 60 migrants on board in difficulty around five miles off the northern French coast. I can speak now to our home and security editor, Mark White. Mark, um, a terrible tragedy, yet one that seems almost inevitable, what with the time of year, the conditions and the continued perilous attempts across the Channel. Uh, struggled to hear what you were saying there, but uh, I can certainly recap what happened in the early hours of this morning. The rescue services in France got the word that this migrant boat that had headed off from the beach at Gravelines, uh, which is near Dunkirk, it was about five miles offshore when it began to sink, uh, when the rescue services got there, they found that uh, the entire one side of the boat is basically made up, of course, of two very large inner tubes uh, down each side of the boat, which the migrants sit on. One of those inner tubes had completely deflated and dozens of migrants were thrown into the water in the pitch black and the freezing cold water of the English Channel. So a full-scale emergency, a search and rescue operation uh, swung into action then with five French vessels, a UK Coast Guard helicopter also brought in to help out. And uh, the within about an hour, we're told, 66 people were pulled from the water and put onto those rescue craft. Uh, one woman uh, who was unconscious was worked on by medics on the vessel for quite some time, but they were unable to revive her. She was declared dead. Another migrant, uh, we don't know at this stage whether that was a man or a woman, was also flown to hospital unconscious. They are described as being in a critical condition uh, at this time. Um, now, as far as the actual investigation is concerned, uh, that's ongoing. What we quite often find is that at this time of the year, when the swells get up in the English Channel, they pack these migrant boats out with more than 60-odd on this occasion, uh, at least 66 on board this vessel. Uh, um, it can just give away at the seams because these boats are not sturdy in the slightest. Uh, and then when they're packed out, when they're in swells being hit by waves, then that can be enough to rip them apart at the seams and, uh, seams and to deflate in this way. We saw just last month another tragedy with two migrants, a man and a woman, drowning in a very similar incident. And it follows multiple other similar incidents in, in the last couple of years. Uh, clearly, it's something that the UK government says uh, as a priority it wants to tackle. That's why it's de determined to push through the Rwanda scheme. 
OK, Mark White, thank you for that update on a harrowing incident in the channel. Now, GB News has sat down with the mother of murdered toddler James Bulger. Denise Fergus spoke of her work to overhaul the UK's parole system. If Venables does get old, these people who are saying, you know, let it go, if you went and killed one of their kids, they'd be saying to me, you should have fought harder. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Put your mouth. OK. Here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. To so join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Can you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Well, it, it, you... <laughs> it's my new teeth. your new teeth. I, I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Kers, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 3.41. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. At 4 o'clock, I'll have the latest on the migrant crisis as Rishi Sunak prepares to hold talks with the leaders of Italy and Albania. Now, the mother of murdered toddler James Bulger has warned parents that their children will never be safe if the parole system isn't overhauled. One of James's killers, John Venables, was denied freedom by the parole board this week after a 30-year-old fight to keep him behind bars. Denise Fergus sat down with GB News presenter Eamon Holmes. Denise says she's finally got justice for her son, but Venables could appeal and get another parole hearing within just two years. He was taken just two weeks shy of his third birthday. I can see him in the lads that I've got now, you know, because they all look so similar. You know, the last thing he asked for, 
and asked him what he wanted for his birthday, it was a birthday cake. He didn't get that birthday cake. But you'd love the chance to give him a birthday cake. God, yeah. On his birthday, when he was first taken, I did place a birthday cake on his resting place, but, you know, it, it, it should have been in front of his face. On the 12th of February, 1993, Robert Thompson and John Venables kidnapped, tortured and killed two-year-old James Bulger in Liverpool. It was one of the most shocking crimes in modern British history. The toddler's murderers were both just 10 years old. A lot of people will know what has happened to James, but they don't really know. They don't really know the detail. They don't really know what was in Venables and Thompson's head and what motivated them and what made them the way they were. What, what do you think this tells us about society, about what's available online, about grooming? What, what's the lesson well, to be learned? There's a lot now that, you know, kids can learn through, you know, social media and stuff like that, but there was nothing like that back then. There was no mobile phones or not. And so, you know, just taking that out of the, you know, the question, it's just pure evilness on their behalf. How sick are they? Were they? I can't call them sick because the sick people out there who need doctors and nurses, they don't, they just, they don't deserve anyone's time. You know, what they did, they took a baby's life and destroyed his family's lives in the, the proceeds of it. And they didn't just take his life, they tortured him. Yeah. That's, that's... In the most horrendous way that they could have taken a child. You see, that's the bit that I find really difficult. There could have been an accident, they could have pushed him over, there could have been something that went wrong and he hit his head, but they didn't, they, they dwelt on this for a long time. They planned to do that, what they done. Uh, they tried to abduct a, a kid two weeks before. So, you know, they took that kid two, two weeks before James has still been here, no doubt. But, you know, they carefully planned that, it was premeditated. So they knew that they were going out that day to take a, a child's life. John Venables was released on licence in 2001, but recalled to prison nine years later after indecent images of children were found on his computer. He was again released in 2013, only to be put behind bars again for the same offence. This time, the parole board were taking no chances. Denise, when you got the phone call yesterday to say that Venables was not being released, how did that feel? I was kind of numb. I, I think I, st I still am in a state of shock because after 30 years, I finally feel like I'm getting listened to now and everything that I've said in the past, you know, it, it's wrong true because I did say, if the two of them weren't properly punished for the crime that they committed, they only spent just over seven years in a, a young offenders. So they never went to an adult prison. And I did say, if they don't spend any time in a, a proper jail, either one or both of them will go on to re offend and commit more crimes. And I was proven right with, with Venables. Where do we go from here, Denise? Venables is, is detained again but it could only be for maybe for two years. You might have to go through all of this again. You know, I've come 30 years fighting justice for James and, you know, I'll do it for as long as I need to, to do it or as long as I can do it. Um, until I get the proper justice, I feel like I've got some kinds of justice for him now because he's been denied parole. And, you know, I am getting the backings of, you know, some MPs now, Dominic Robb and uh, Alex Chalk, you know, what they've been saying to me, they've stood by their words and, you know, they, they, they've helped me get some kinds of justice, which I've never had before. The government is pushing through an overhaul of the parole system, with new laws allowing ministers to block the release of the most dangerous criminals. It just feels like now I'm, I'm just getting support from, you know, the, the MPs, because this is the first time I've got to, actually got to, to meet, meet them and, you know, they've stuck to what they've told me. Yeah. What would you say, Denise, to people? This is not me saying this, but I know there will be people watching and listening to us and say, for goodness sake, Venables and Thompson were 10 years old at the time. They were, they were babies themselves. Well, how can you keep going on punishing them? One of them needs punishing because he's behind bars again. If Venables gets out, let's make him an example. If he gets out, these people who were saying, well, he would only 10, you know, you know, it's been 30 years now, let it go. Why should I want, he was my son. 
he's not here to speak for himself, so I'm doing a forum. And two, if Venables does get out, these people who are saying, you know, let it go, if he went and killed one of their kids, they'd be saying to me, you should have fought harder. Yes. I mean, I know you, you've become, another, you know, you've got another grandchild now. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. I see pictures of you with your grandchildren. I can't do that. Where are you at, Denise? If I was to ask you now, here we are in 2023, we're heading into Christmas. What state are you in? I'm not in any state. I'm in a good place. I've got, you know, my husband's, my three boys, I've got my family, my, my granddaughter. You know, I'm, I'm in a happy place. The only time I'm not is when something like this occurs and I've got to take on another fight, but it's my choice and I'll carry on doing it. Do you live for James? I live for my lads, all, all of my lads. So you're not going to be simply defined by this one horrible aspect of your life? No, because I'm two people, I, th I think I'm two people. Um, I'm a mum, but I'm also a campaigner. And, you know, for as long as I've got breath in me, I will carry on campaigning to get justice, not just for me, but for anyone who needs it out there. And for people who will say a prayer for you this Christmas, what would you say to them? I'd say, say a prayer for James. Say a prayer for Venables and Thompson? No. no. Why not? They don't need prayers. To people who say they need understanding, they need forgiveness. They, they, they basically did get forgiveness, but one chose, he didn't want that forgiveness and carries on doing what he wants to do. He's not just a child murderer, he's also a paedophile. So they don't deserve any good. They've been given too many chances, especially Venables. You know, he's been given chance after chance, new rehabilitation, new names, this, that, and the other, loads of money spent on him. You know, he didn't deserve that, but he got it. And look where he's ended up, back in prison. Is there anything, anything at all Venables could do that would lift him in terms of your estimation? Yeah. In the same prison. It's an astonishing interview. I thought that was an absolutely fabulous piece of work there by Eamon Holmes, That's asking difficult questions. Searching questions, but getting a lot out. I think that was excellent. Really makes you think. Now, to a warning that the UK is facing a period of heightened risk after a Hamas plot to murder Jews in Europe was disrupted by intelligence agencies. Three people were arrested in Denmark, three in Germany and another in the Netherlands. German officials revealed that four of the seven suspects are indeed members of Hamas. And I'm joined now by a reporter, Charlie Peters. Charlie, that in itself is harrowing enough, but I guess my question to you is we've seen warnings recently to be on extra special alerts, particularly around Christmas markets. Is there an increased terror risk of this kind of attack by Hamas operatives happening here in the UK? Well, the Joint Terrorism Analysis Centre has not raised the threat level in Britain. But at the same time, counter-terrorism cops in London and indeed across Britain are issuing warnings for people to remain especially vigilant around the Christmas period. The Danish police indeed said the same earlier this month, just weeks before they made these arrests last night. And it's worth stressing that of the seven arrests last night, only four have been named as affiliated with Hamas. And that's those uh, prosecuted by the Germans. Three arrests in Germany and one in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, there was some clarification from the Danish side last night saying that while the planned attack that they foiled was linked to the conflict in Israel and Gaza, they do not believe that there is a link to Hamas at this stage. Hamas have also denied any affiliation with any of those arrested in Europe last night because this would suggest a significant change in the tactics and procedures of the terrorist organisation. You can bet this morning that the security agencies across Europe and indeed in Britain will be briefing this as vital intelligence. This is a significant threat to life in Europe because for many years 
Hamas have confined their operations to the Middle East, particularly in Lebanon, of course, but also in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, focusing in on Israel. So if there is this plot developing in Europe, and this attack appears to have been foiled where weapons were being shipped to Berlin for an attack on Jewish institutions, then that would mark a vital and very menacing shift in Hamas strategy. So security experts telling GB News this morning that there is a heightened risk to Britain marking that change in procedure. But as it stands, no official updated warning from the authorities in Britain on the terrorism threat from Hamas. OK, Chola Peters, thank you for that update. And I'm still joined in the studio here by our political editor, Chris. This is an issue that politically has become a hot potato, particularly um, around the policing. The fear there is two-tier policing. Suella Bravham, of course, was very adamant that there was two-tier policing. But how, how sensitive is this politically? Well, very, and we are seeing increasingly the UK government is taking action against members of Hamas. Just two days ago, the UK government sank, um, put uh, uh, restrictions on travel and, and where, where people can go from Hamas. Six members of Hamas were sanctioned, including the leader, Mahmoud Zahar. So they are looking, they are squeezing that, uh, that terrorist group w w as best they can in terms of, of, um, of di diplomatically, but there must be concerns in the UK of any kind of uh, rival uh, attacks or, or being foiled, as you saw there in Denmark and Germany. Germany. Certainly, I felt. I certainly felt, and many felt, that the tension around Remembrance Sunday was getting very, very intense indeed. I think it has calmed down since then, but that risk must always remain. Okay, Chris Oak, thank you very much for that update. Now, Piers Morgan has come out fighting after the judge in Prince Harry's case, court case, accepted evidence that a new journalist were involved in the practice, and indeed, he gave a a press statement on his doorstep not so long ago, and he said, to be clear, I have zero knowledge of that story. Um, Obed Scobie lied about me in court. He also laid into Anissa Campbell, who he called a proven liar, and he rounded off by saying Prince Harry's mission isn't to clean up the press. His real mission is to destroy the royal family. An extraordinary statement. We'll have much more on that in the next hour. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, and this is Britain's News Channel. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, welcome to your latest GB News weather update from the Met Office. We'll stay cloudy and rather mild for many of us through the rest of the day, but overnight it does turn windier across the north as well as wetter too. That's because we've got this string of weather fronts out in the Atlantic. They'll continue to stream in wet weather across northern areas of the UK, particularly across for the far north of Scotland. Elsewhere, though, it will stay dry through the rest of the evening. We'll see some clear spells in the south and east, so it will feel a little bit cooler here, but elsewhere we've got a strong breeze and a southerly breeze and very mild air for the time of year so it will be an exceptionally mild night tonight with temperatures not dipping much below 10 or 11 degrees for parts of Scotland however it will stay quite wet and windy across parts of Scotland throughout Saturday and into the afternoon the rain will become quite heavy and persistent further south though it will stay dry once again through much of the day but there will be quite a lot of cloud around however it's still staying very mild through Saturday and through much of the weekend as well with highs of around 12 to 13 degrees across the UK which is quite high for this time of year. However, the persistent rain across Scotland will continue through Saturday night and won't relent all the way through Sunday as well. So we do have an amber rain warning in force for parts of the Highlands and into the Ar Argyle as well. A yellow warning as well more widely. That rain will sink southwards into Monday and Tuesday to more southern areas of the UK, allowing cooler air to arrive in the north. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. 
Sundays on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, it's 4pm. I'm Martin Dorby, bringing you all the latest headlines from our Westminster studios. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is in Italy for an immigration conference with right-wing leaders, but as Elon Musk makes a surprise appearance, I'll ask, is Rishi doing a Nick Clegg and gearing up for a plum Silicon Valley job after he loses the next general election? I've slayed a dragon, says Prince Harry, as he's, he wins an historic £140,000 privacy case against the Mirror Group. Cameron Walker will join me live in the studio to give me all the very latest, including that blistering press conference from Piers Morgan shortly and a while ago. Now, as police in Europe make seven arrests to stop Hamas attacks on Jewish targets, we'll ask this. Is a terror threat in the UK rising? Charlie Peters will bring us up to speed. And remember... And remember, we want to hear from you. Please do get in touch with your opinions, all the usual ways. GBviews at gbnews.com will read out the best points during the show. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Sam Francis. Martin, thank you. Good afternoon. It's just gone four o'clock. I'm Sam Francis in the GB Newsroom. Well, our top story this hour, Prince Harry says it's a great day for truth and accountability after being awarded more than £140,000 in damages over phone hacking claims against a tabloid newspaper group. The High Court ruled there was extensive phone hacking by the Mirror Group newspapers between 2006 and 2011. In response, the publisher says they apologise unreservedly for any historical wrongdoing. The judge also said journalists were involved in phone hacking at the time Piers Morgan worked for the Daily Mirror. 
But the former editor claims he has never hacked a phone or told anyone else to hack a phone. As for him saying this is a good day for truth, the Duke has been repeatedly exposed in recent years as someone who wouldn't know the truth if it slapped him around his California tanned face. He demands accountability for the press, but refuses to accept any for himself for smearing the royal family, his own family, as a bunch of callous racists without producing a shred of proof to support those disgraceful claims. Well, Piers Morgan's comments come in response to a statement made by Prince Harry's lawyer earlier, David Sherborne. This case is not just about hacking. It is about a systemic practice of unlawful and appalling behaviour, followed by cover-ups and destruction of evidence, the shocking scale of which can only be revealed through these proceedings. The court has found that Mirror Group's principal board directors, their legal department, senior executives and editors such as Piers Morgan clearly knew about or were involved in these illegal activities. Well, elsewhere, a British schoolboy who went missing six years ago in France should be able to return to his family in the UK tomorrow. That's according to French officials who have been working with UK police on the situation. Alex Batty, who went missing uh, in 2017, is now 17 himself after going on a family holiday to Spain. Detectives believe he was abducted by his mother to live an alternative lifestyle abroad. Here in the UK, police say there is no evidence of third-party involvement after a body was found in a river during their search for a missing mother of three. Gaynor Lord went missing in Norwich last Friday, with CCTV footage showing her leaving work. Norfolk police say the body hasn't been formally identified, but her family have been notified. The force says it remains open-minded about the circumstances of the 55-year-old's disappearance and will continue to pursue all lines of inquiry. The Home Secretary says the government must and will do more after one person has died in the English Channel. Another is still in a critical condition. A boat carrying migrants sank about five miles off the coast of Dunkirk overnight. More than 60 people were also rescued. James Cleverly described the incident as a horrific reminder of the people smugglers' brutality. And relatives of two people killed at a London music venue have renewed their appeal for information one year on from a fatal crush. 23-year-old security guard Gabby Hutchinson and 33-year-old Rebecca Aikumelo were killed when fans without tickets tried to force their way into Brixton Academy. The Metropolitan Police has released CCTV images of people that they're looking to speak to about the incident and confirmed that one arrest has been made. The parents of Rebecca say they want justice. We don't know what happened to her. We don't know how how um, she died, and we're, we're, we're still waiting for for information um, as to how this happened. And um, I mean, the most important thing is um, we don't want this to happen to another family. This is GB News across the UK. We're on your TV, in your car, digital radio, and on your smart speaker. Now, though, more from Martin. Thank you, Sam. Now, we start with the latest on the migrant crisis and Rishi Sunak will meet Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney this weekend for talks on immigration. Sunak and Maloney met in October to discuss efforts to coordinate an international response to migration. Well, I'm joined now in our studio by political editor Christopher Hope. Chris, it would seem like a good idea. Giorgia Maloney has a fantastic deal with Albania. Um, she's stopping the boats getting into Italy by just turning them over to Albania. They spent money there on containment centres with high security. Fantastic idea. Why don't we do the same? Well, we do, we do our Rwanda plan, which is deporting people arriving here legally to be, to be um, processed in Rwanda, and they can't come back 5,000 miles away. We've got this kind of massive bazooka. In a sense, the idea is if, when you, if you get here illegally, you're flown 5,000 miles away to the heart of Africa, and then you'd have to take your chances there, really, although there's obviously um, the Rwanda government is saying they'll be protected and kept made safe there. So the, the different idea is offshore processing, which is what Germany's looking at, mm. uh, Italy's done with Albania. And in fact, I think I sense that Labour could even go towards that policy ahead of the election. They've got no real answer to Rwanda. If Rwanda, Rwanda starts to work, they will stop that scheme working. But the idea of offshore processing is quite attractive, I think, to politicians, because currently we're putting people up in hotels.
Yeah. And that's almost a pull factor for those coming across. Come to Britain, stay in a hotel. I mean, it's not nice at all in the hotels, but you can see how it can be pitched the wrong way, can't you, by, by um, people smugglers. I think a lot of people think it is quite nice <laughs> in a four-star hotel getting three free meals a day mm. and all your central no, eating, lot, blasting it's out. Quite, it's quite lonely for them sometimes. I mean, I, I mean, the reality isn't great, but how it looks is not great for the government. OK, well, it's certainly £8 million pounds a day is not a good look for the government. Elon Musk has yes. hoved into view. Um, Elon Musk seems to spend quite a lot of time with Rishi Sunak. You could say we've got a bit of a bromance going on, a big tech bromance. You may hear the cynicism in my tone because Rishi Sunak talks a lot about in the future um, a role in AI, politically, Britain. He wants to see at the spearhead of that. But is there more to this? And call me a cynic. <laughs> is there more to this? Is Rishi Sunak polishing up his CV, <laughs> a sort of a sort of superannuated Nick Clegg on steroids, working hand in hand with this chum Elon Musk uh, in the it, future in Silicon Valley? It's a bit cynical, Martin. <laughs> Even for me, and I've been around the, I've been around the block a few times in Westminster. I mean, yes, of course, if he loses the election next year, he may not hang around as an MP. He may stay on. Theresa May stayed on. Others stay on. But he, if he leaves politics, he may feel his future is in California, where he's got a home, where Elon Musk is based, and AI is a key part of Elon Musk's future business. E Elon Musk came over, went to Bletchley Park. Mm. George Maloney went to Ble Bletchley Park for that meeting about AI. So there's a bit of a kind of... The three of them get on very well. Certainly, Sunak and Maloney got on very well indeed. They met at the G20 in Italy. They're the kind of same age, uh, and, and I think we need our friends in the European Union, and we're we're using quite cleverly, I think, Maloney to get to get, and he's a right right wing leader, so mm. a good a good. There's lots of common cause, and on migration, no question, the Italian coastline is seen as being as porous as the UK southern border. And it's interesting. We spoke to Paola Diana early on, who's a commentator um, on Italian politics, and she was saying to us. The, there was no resistance in the Italian media or, or from the Italian public to the offshore containment idea in Albania because the process it is... The, 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 the arrivals of boats is so visible, so unfair, crime is so rife, and yet here... Rishi seems to bow to the criticism or be shy away from it in a way that Sweller Braverman wasn't. Do you think um, miracles might happen and Rishi well, might Christmas go to Italy time. and come back tough? It's Christmas time, Martin. Yeah. Miracles might happen. I, I think, I, I think Mrs. Sunak does understand that the, the, the tension, the anger, the frustration amongst people about the unfairness of small boats arriving. He says he's proud to be to be the son of a migrant family. He doesn't. He, he can definitely see why it needs to be dealt with. I think you know, Sweller Braverman was making space for him to do that, and we'll find out soon enough. He says the first flights take off in, in the spring to Rwanda. There's a long road to get there first, though. And I have to ask you about that, that bet you've got <laughs> with Rishi Sunak. I'd say every time you bet one oh. pint of beer that a single person won't go to Rwanda, a single flight won't fly before the next general election, is that beer safe? No, it's, it's less safe after last after this week. I think the fact that that went through with a 44-seat majority, the Rwanda bill, there's opportunity now. I mean, I, I'm with Geoffrey Cox, you know, there's a few th things about yeah. legal, legal tax. He thinks it's better, better than even chance of flights taking off in May. So I think it's a bit less... I'm going to hold my beer a bit tighter so it's not grabbed by Rishi Sunak. Well, I like your glass half for latitude, but I think the beer's safe. <laughs> now, moving on to the latest on the battle to stop migrants being housed on the former RAF base in Essex. RAF Weathersfield, of course, could house as many as 1,700 male asylum seekers. But the charity Care for Calais is taking legal action against the government. It says its efforts are a bid to literally safeguard people's lives. Well, I'm joined now by Alan McKenzie, who is the chair of the Fields Association. Thanks for joining us on the show, Alan. Alan, I think a lot of people will be quite confused here because people that live around the RAF bases, both at Scampton and Wethersfield, don't want military-aged men in their thousands to go to them, and neither do the so-called friends of the asylum seekers care for Calais. What would be the reasoning of care for Calais being against this? We just lost him. The point I want to make, if Alan, we forget him back, is that Care, Care for Calais basically agree with the people who live near bases. Chris, let's talk about this in the studio. I find it astonishing that, that they want the same thing, but for very, very different reasons. Now, Care for Calais will maintain, I, I've read their press release, mm. that it's inhumane, it's not safe, it's unfair. But they actually want the same thing as people who want to stop the boat. 
Well, that, that, that's right. Kev Kelly are concerned about how they're treated. But, of course, this is the, this is the UK. I mean, I think they've got, to, they've got to be housed somewhere. This seems like an appropriate solution to put them in hotels. That's also offends communities and it's difficult to understand for many people who wonder why they can't get us into a local hotel this Christmas because it's got migrants staying in them. So I think that there's a, I think the, often these, these um, campaign groups risk losing public support. They come from the right place. They are trying to make... They're trying to deal with the situation in Kev Calais is they try and improve lives for, for people... It, in Calais, in those, in those councils, they wait, they wait to cross over. But how much, to what extent are you damaging actually your case by taking these legal challenges? Well, I've been a cynic about Rishi Sunak with Elon Musk, and I'm going to be a cynic about this too. I don't think that Care for Calais want to stop them going into RAF bases. I think they want to continue their business model mm. of welcoming um, asylum seekers to the UK and, and dotting them around the UK in communities that won't affect mm. where they live. I think the bleeding hearts aren't necessarily always their first eye isn't on the welfare of people who, after all, are staying in barracks that have been perfectly it, hospitable for RAF crews for many, many decades. It comes to the right place. I mean, Care for Calais is trying to look after people who are living, living homeless, really, before they're waiting to come across to the UK. But at what point do the do charities start to, start to almost reinforce the behaviours they're trying to help so it becomes a kind of support service? I know that Lee Anderson on the Home Affairs Committee, when he was on that, went out there. He was concerned, not necessarily about Care for Calais, but generally what he saw, he was concerned about to what extent is of our groups helping migrants to come across, when, they, when in fact they should be trying to dissuade them from coming in the first place. It's been interesting politically, because there's been huge resistance from locals wherever these places are put, either at Scampton, of course, that's the, that's the famous site of the Dambusters, yeah. huge historical significance and cultural significance in Wethersfield, in Essex, also at Linton on Ouse. People don't want these in their backyard, and yet the courts find in favour of this, and the government seems to be pressing ahead with this despite the public resistance. Is this another example, Chris, you think, of the government being completely tin-eared to the well, needs the, of locals? They probably go somewhere. I mean, 1,700 adult males does, is probably alarming for people living nearby. They don't know who they are. And can they, are they able to free to associate with the community, walk around? That, I mean, then it's the idea of being imposed on. But what are the alternatives? Um, you can't... It's cold. You can't do camps, you can't do marquees. I mean, this is the best the government can do, I think, to prepare the government. I think hotels are much, much more controversial because that, that can be really disturbing for many, many different communities. But in Calais, they care for Calais, they, they're under tarpaulins, they're in tents, they're on beaches, and you may not think that's good, mm. but that's the situation. Maybe that's why they're so keen to come to Britain. Yes, I, th I think certainly the hotels are a draw. Um, I think having more Spartan accommodation. I mean, they, they were looking, weren't it, student accommodation? I think during the holiday season in, in in the summer. But I think this is the best. These, I think we're going to see a lot more of these camps being used for housing migrants. I think this is the way it's going to go until they can deal with the backlog and get Rwanda working. It's going to have to happen. But then there's still a sticking point of the notion they won't actually be contained, as it were, to the no. premises. Like in Linton and News, I went to Linton and News and I spoke to many, many families there. And the, it was about 150 people lived in this village and they were going to dump six or 700 mil military-aged mm. men on a village with one ch fish and chip mm. shop, didn't even have a pub. And they were going to be free just to wander around. In fact, they were getting a free bus pass into town. So... The idea that they're, they're imprisoned in an inhumane manner isn't yeah. reality. In actual fact, they'll be free to, to roam around Which to do what? Nothing wrong with that, because they're not, they're not criminals, are they? They're just people, people walking around. But I guess it feel, might feel a bit imposing to have a large number of people suddenly walking around. And, and there's a lack of understanding of why they're there. So it's probably down to community uh, leaders there to, to facilitate, facilitate meetings with them, probably, and, and ensure that everyone feels relaxed about a difficult national situation. But it goes back to the beginning. The heart of all this is why can't this government control borders. Many voted for to leave the European Union, Union to control borders and borders and, and laws. It's not happening, and it's a failure on this government's part, and they will be punished at the election. I think next year's election, will immigration will be a huge issue in it, and here's a case in point. Yeah, and if they stopped the boats, and they wouldn't need to put them on RAF bases, they wouldn't need to put them in £8 million a day hotels, but Correct. they're measurably not achieving that. OK, thanks, Chris. Now it's time for the Great British Giveaway and your chance to win treats, tech and £10,000 in cash. And here's how you can start your new year with all of those superb prizes.
You really could be the winner of the very first Great British Giveaway and receive nearly £12,000 worth of prizes from us. First, we've got a simply stunning £10,000 in tax-free cash to give you. Cash that you can spend on anything you like. Next, how about a new phone? You'll also get a brand new iPhone 15 Pro Max. And if all of that wasn't enough, how about a further £500 in shopping vouchers to spend at the store of your choice? For your chance to win the iPhone, the vouchers and £10,000 cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB01, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 5th of January. Full terms and privacy notice at GBNews.com forward slash win. Good luck. Now, there's a rare bit of good news for Prince Harry today, and God knows he needs it. He's been awarded more than 140 grand after his phone hacking case against Mirror Group newspapers. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes a, here comes a train. <laughs> Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's News Channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. To join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, 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 you? <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's your teeth. It's, I, I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Welcome back. It's 421. You're watching or listening to me, Martin Daubney, on GB News. Now, later this hour, we'll discuss the terrorist who's been jailed for 16 years after he plotted to murder a Christian speaker at Speaker's Corner. Now, Prince Harry has been awarded more than £140,000 in damages after a phone hacking case. The Duke of Sussex took the action against Mirror Group newspapers and hailed today's ruling as a great day for truth as well as accountability. The judge also ruled that former editor of the Daily Mirror, Piers Morgan, both knew about and took part in phone hacking during his tenure at the paper. The broadcaster has, however, fiercely denied any claims he ever hacked a phone or ordered anyone else to do so. As for him saying this is a good day for truth, the Duke has been repeatedly exposed in recent years as someone who wouldn't know the truth if it slapped him around his California tanned face. He demands accountability for the press, but refuses to accept any for himself for smearing the royal family, his own family, as a bunch of callous racists without producing a shred of proof to support those disgraceful claims. I think that is what you call not taking it lying down. Now, I'm joined in the studio by our royal correspondent, Cameron Walker. Cameron, so it started as a good news day for Prince Harry, and now it's all out bedlam again. Well, Piers Morgan certainly doesn't mince his words, does he? Let's put it that way. Yeah, I mean, Piers Morgan has very much fought back here. So just to recap, the judge ruled earlier today in Prince Harry versus Mirror Group newspapers that Piers Morgan uh, knew about phone hacking to some extent when he was editor of the Daily um, Mirror. Pr uh, Piers Morgan has denied that in the statement. He says, I have consistently said for many years now, I've never hacked a phone phone or told anybody else to hack a phone. But then he very much went on the attack. Mm. He fought back. First, he mentioned Omid Scobie, Prince Harry's unofficial, let's say, uh, or, or a biographer, uh, calling him a liar, saying that he lied about him in his new book. He then um, called Alistair Campbell a proven liar. And then he went on the attack mm. against Prince Harry himself, saying it's an outrage that um, Prince Harry is accusing the media of intruding on his private life but then he's intruded on the private lives of his own family members. And in mm. fact, he very, uh, he, he says about the Queen, the late Queen and Prince Philip dying and Prince Harry going on media interviews and talking about his problems uh, within the royal family. And he also says that um, P Prince Harry and his wife Meghan are on a mission to destroy mm. the royal family. So strong words from him there. Yeah, and while I was at it, a side swipe at Alistair Campbell, who we called a proven liar, who led us into an illegal war. He said that the day was filled with false allegations spewed against me by those with an axe to grind. But the, the comment that's, that's saying that Harry himself referred or branded the royal family callous racists without a shred of proof... That is a, is a low blow, and that is really going to reignite this confrontation. I think it certainly will, but what we have to remember is that all the accusations of royal racists or whatever happened within the last couple of years. This Mirror Group newspaper's case with Prince Harry and other high-profile figures, uh, the final article was written in 2011, so we're talking decades-old articles here, and it is all about unlawful information gathering. Prince Harry accused Mirror Group newspapers of hacking his phone, um, blagging to get information about him and using private investigators to get mm. private information about him. The judge has ruled that 15 of the 33 articles written about Prince Harry in this case did indeed result from unlawful information gathering. Mirror Group newspapers has um, apologised unreservedly for the historical wrongdoing and has paid Prince Harry £140,600 in damages. But I don't think it's about the money for Prince Harry. It's about having his day in court and taking his fight um, against the Br British media and trying to change the way uh, they operate. And Cameron, when you look at some of the stories in question that were um, obtained uh, via nefarious ways, they're, they're very sensitive to, to Prince Harry, um, his drug taking, his love life with Chelsea. Um, you can see why he would have taken issue and, and wanted to go to court. But I wonder if the money isn't the point. It was meant to be a more moralistic battle against the press, but now Piers Morgan has just kicked that over. Yeah, I mean, I was in the courtroom with Prince Harry for two days listening to him give his evidence. He was visibly upset at points. I think it clearly has affected him. A lot of these articles, as you say, very personal to him, talking about his uh, alleged drug use, his the breakdown of his relationship yeah. with Chelsea Davey. He blames on the media articles written about him. Um, and he very much wants his day in court. He sees it really 
as his life's mission to hold those people account. And this is only one of several court cases he has against uh, different newspaper groups. He uh, has separate claims against uh, Association Newspapers, publisher of the Daily Mail, and News Group Newspapers, publishers of The Sun, accusing them both of unlawful information gathering, and we're expecting trials for them uh, next year and the year after. So we could well see Prince Harry back in a courtroom in London, uh, having his day in court again, delivering evidence. So certainly today, would you say, is round one to Prince Harry? That legally, though know, he's won, he's got 140 grand, that won't make, that's chump change to somebody like him. But do you think Piers Morgan's um, comments will come across as bitter and they'll bounce off Prince Harry's arm? Or, would they, or will they once again smart? Because Harry, or at least his brief, took the decision to, to name-check Piers Morgan in that statement straight after the ruling. Do you think he might regret that now? Oh, well, it's hard to say. It's only for Harry to say if he'll regret it or not. But what I would say is that Prince Harry, it wasn't a full win because he wanted £440,000 from Mirror Group newspapers. He only got around a quarter of that because only some of the articles were found to be uh, in breach of, the, of those laws. Um, as for Piers Morgan, I think... Prince Harry has won the battle, but he's certainly not won the war when it comes to the press. There's a lot... He calls on the Metropolitan Police, of course, uh, to, to, to investigate the such allegations. They are not saying anything at the moment. We'll have to wait and see. Watch this space, Martin. Cameron Walker, superb, and it's certainly a right royal battle that's going to be raging on. Now, Democratic Unionist Party's officers will meet on Friday to discuss a potential return to Stormont. This comes ahead of another roundtable talk of sessions in Hillsborough due for Monday. And although, although the DUP are insisting this is more about the economic situation in Northern Ireland rather than talks on the framework. Well, I'm joined now in the studio by Northern Ireland reporter Doogie Beattie. Doogie, thanks for joining us in the studio. Will we at last see a breakthrough with these talks? Well, no, I, I don't believe we will because... What the, the talks are all about the money that's coming into Northern Ireland and how that's produced. That goes through the Holtham <coughs> um, theory, uh, which says that how much you get over £100 per head that's spent in London. Wales get about 115 Scotland get 129 Northern Ireland is still running on the barn of consequentials, and they really need that ceiling of about £58 million at the top end of it on each year's budget. Otherwise, the, the uh, executive will just be short each and every year. And those pay raises that they may fix with that check now, next year they'll not be able to support those pay raises because the money won't be there. But then we really have these separate talks going on with the DUP and Westminster. Mm. And what the DUP is really asking for is no longer in the gift of Westminster. That's with the EU because the framework document give away the foundations of the Irish Sea border to the EU. So things such as... Uh, manufacturing to EU standards. Those in Northern Ireland, that 70% of their, their exports go to the UK, not into the EU. They're saying, why should we have to manufacture to EU standards? The EU are saying, well, that cannot go in uh, to the EU, leaking across a borderless border. So manufacturers are very unhappy with that. Things like we saw the other day, of state aid. The EU yeah. now agreeing what state aid Northern Ireland... Astonishing. Can, yeah, uh, it's absolutely astonishing. Britain has lost control of that inside part of the UK. And, you know, if the Giga factory that was built, that was built with uh, state aid, and most companies, especially foreign direct investment companies, look for a state aid package that'll take them up to five or six years in order to become established. Well, Northern Ireland can't give that, so that will really start to push back those that want to give state aid, uh, and it will make sure that those companies don't invest in Northern Ireland. So there's quite a lot coming down the road, but there's talks about talks going on. So the first talks with the Treasury, that's what we're looking at on Monday, because no matter what happens, the public sector needs paid. Uh, but Sinn Féin is running out of patience, and I, I do believe that the British government at this time are worried that, she, that Sinn Féin are going to walk away from these talks mm -hmm. completely, which will leave everything up in the air with no assembly at all. And this all goes back to the Good Friday Agreement, where we talk about consent. So Monday may be a day. The British government are really looking for a soft yes mm. out of the DUP to try and get them through Christmas. But if those talks don't go well with the EU and the British government, well, who knows what'll happen. Superb analysis. Great stuff. Thank you, Dougie Beattie. Always a pleasure.
Now, there's lots more still to come between now and four o'clock, and there's a warning that Brits are facing a heightened risk after a Hamas plot to murder Jews in Europe was disrupted. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Sam Francis. Martin, thank you. Good afternoon. It's just gone half past four. The headlines. Prince Harry says it's a great day for truth and accountability after being awarded more than £140,000 in damages over phone hacking claims against a tabloid newspaper group. The High Court ruled there was extensive phone hacking by the Mirror Group newspapers between 2006 and 2011. In response, the publisher says they do apologise unreservedly for any historical wrongdoing. The judge also said journalists were involved in phone hacking at the time Piers Morgan worked for the Daily Mirror. But the former editor claims he has never hacked a phone or told anyone else to hack a phone. As for him saying this is a good day for truth, the Duke has been repeatedly exposed in recent years as someone who wouldn't know the truth if it slapped him around his California tanned face. He demands accountability for the press, but refuses to accept any for himself for smearing the royal family, his own family, as a bunch of callous racists without producing a shred of proof to support those disgraceful claims. A British schoolboy who went missing six years ago in France should be able to return to his family in the UK tomorrow. That's according to French officials who've been working with UK police on the situation. Alex Batty, who is now 17, went missing in 2017 after going on a family holiday to Spain. Detectives believe he was abducted by his mother to live an alternative lifestyle abroad. Here in the UK, police say there is no evidence of third-party involvement after a body was found in a river during their search for a missing mother of three. Gaynor Lord went missing in Norwich last Friday, with CCTV footage being released that showed her leaving work. Norfolk police say the body hasn't been formally identified, but her family have been notified. The force says it remains open-minded about the circumstances of the 55-year-old's disappearance and will continue to pursue all lines of inquiry. The Home Secretary says the government must and will do more after one person has died in the English Channel. Another is still in a critical condition. A boat carrying migrants sank about five miles off the coast of Dunkirk overnight. More than 60 people were rescued. James Cleverley's described the incident as a horrific reminder of the people smugglers' brutality. And you can get more on all of those stories by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Thanks, Sam. Now to a warning that the UK is facing a period of heightened risk after a Hamas plot to murder Jews in Europe was disrupted by intelligence agencies. Three people were arrested in Denmark, three in Germany and another in the Netherlands. German officials revealed that four of the seven suspects are, in fact, members of Hamas. Well, I'm joined now by our reporter, Charlie Peters, for an update on this. Charlie, so a successful sting across Europe. The question I have for you is, should we be more on a heightened state of alert here in the UK? Well, that's what security experts have told GB News this morning, reacting to news of these arrests coming in last night. And the question really on their minds, and indeed I imagine on the minds of many seniors in the security and intelligence agencies across Europe, is have Hamas gone global? Because previously, their operations have been limited to the West Bank, to Israel, and of course to the Gaza Strip, their main base of operations. They have not planned significant operations in Europe or indeed in Britain for many decades. But now this concern has been raised after this foiled plot been disrupted by intelligence agencies in Germany and indeed in Denmark. Now, the Danish uh, chiefs today stressing that they don't know of any links between Hamas and those that they've arrested. They haven't confirmed that situation. But the German prosecutor has been very clear, making that direct link between the terror group based in Gaza and those they've arrested yesterday, including two Lebanese-born individuals and one Egyptian citizen. It's said that the links were well-established with the armed wing of Hamas 
and also that they were receiving direction from Lebanon to carry weapons into Berlin and specifically, German prosecutors claim, to carry out attacks on Jewish targets in Berlin. Now, the Jewish interior minister said that the protection of Jews was their top priority. And that also begs the question that Hamas, which regularly is claiming to be targeting specifically Israeli targets, could now be targeting broadly Jewish targets throughout Europe and possibly even Britain. And Charlie, concerning news there, we were told to be on heightened alert around Christmas markets because of the significance culturally of them and of gatherings of people. Um, and now a report out yesterday saying 80% of British Jews feel less safe. And this is specifically targeting synagogues, Jewish schools. That will really add to the heightened sense of anxiety that the Jewish community is feeling in the UK. Mm. And the Community Security Trust, the charity that advises Jewish institutions on their security, has said that the news last night of these arrests is concerning. They said that they couldn't draw a direct link to the situation in Britain. But we have heard, haven't we, repeated warnings from British police and counter-terrorism cops for people to remain extra vigilant in Britain at the moment during Christmas. I think it's also worth stressing that the Hamas official who denied a link between his terrorist organisation and those arrests last night two weeks ago, urged people to target American and British interests. And that also comes two months after that so-called day of rage on October the 13th, when we did see terror attacks in Europe, a mass stabbing event in northern France. More recently, we've seen shootings in Belgium and attacks elsewhere. So a heightened sense of security in Europe, but also in Britain as this conflict continues. Charlie Peters, thank you. Superb update. Now, just only one in four companies expect their staff to be in the office full-time in the coming years. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, eight till nine on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. 
GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 4.42. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now I'm joined by an expert panel today in the studio. We have the former BBC executive and presenter, Roger Bolton, and Ed Davis, who's, at, who's the policy director at the Centre for Social Justice. Got a few stories I'm going to run through with the lads. Up first, for discussion, the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, hails a victory for Ukraine and Europe as EU leaders agree to open membership talks with the Ukraine. So the big question is, should the Ukraine be allowed to join the EU? Why don't we start with you, Roger, on this one? Um, there are many reasons why I think it's not such a good idea, but what, what's your take on this? Well, I think you've got to look at this in the light of the fact that President Trump may be... President Trump again. Mm. Uh, he's talked about withdrawing from NATO. He's uh, very much, uh, well, I won't say opposed, but not enthusiastic for aid for Ukraine. So it's not surprising, and any questions the future of NATO in its present form. So it's not surprising uh, that the Ukrainians very much want to be part of the EU. Mm. Uh, my own view is that uh, they should be, but not fast tracked. This is a very dangerous situation, and I think that, you know, Slowly, slowly, but yes, we should give them hope and yes, we should, uh, in the end, give them membership, but we should be very careful. Ed, a lot of people would say that the reasons we shouldn't do this are manifest. First of all, um, Transparency International, which charts global corruption, has Ukraine at 116 out of 180 countries, plus it's at war, and it may further enrage Putin, who's always said expanding the EU or expanding NATO is a red line. With all of that in mind, surely it's not a good idea? I mean, I would certainly agree, uh, agree with Roger that this needs to be gently, gently, carefully, carefully. I certainly wouldn't fast-track anything, but also because of the bigger picture of what's going on in the EU at the moment. I mean, the fact that Hungary has come in mm. and said we're not happy about this, doesn't just speak to Hungary, it speaks to the fact that most members of the EU at the moment are experiencing a, a huge shift in their politics. Mm. And I think what we're going to see over the next few years is, you know, more coalition governments. We're going to see it harder to make decisions within their own countries. And so making decisions as an entire EU is just going to become harder and harder. Mm. So whether you want to jump into that, I'd say, is a question itself. But it also just brings into question how unified the EU is going to be three, five, ten years from now anyway. But you have to look forward to a possibility where NATO is no longer the NATO we once thought it was, mm -hmm. where the American guarantee that has allowed us to spend less on defence in Europe than in a way we should have done. I mean, we were better at UK than most European, all, I think, other European countries. But we may be moving to a situation where we can't rely on American defence. And we know we've got a player in Russia who is, um, well, we would say probably not the most rational of people, who apparently is up to 16% uh, of GNP he's spending on defence. And that's why you see Finland and a whole range of other countries saying, whoops, we'd like to be neutral, but it's moving towards a situation where we can't be, therefore we have to be part of NATO, part of the West. Against that, we must be very, very careful in what we do, but ultimately I, I would think we should have Ukraine in the EU, but go very, very slowly. This is very dangerous but stuff. A lot of people point out the country's at war. Economically, economically, it's a basket case. So how could it ever hope to fulfil the economic criteria as a net contributor? It simply couldn't. Therefore, it will be a, a leech on the member state finances. So this isn't about the actual criteria. You could say it's about an, expansive, an expansion of the EU, irrespective of the logic. This is just the European Union wants to expand its reach and, I would say, um, try and play its part as the peacemaker, as a kind of pound shop NATO. Well, you use pound shop. I don't think that's fair. Um, <laughs> uh, what I think is before... You, we should also have membership, but, of course, it will have to qualify. 
But if we say we're actually not going to listen to you, we're not going to give the chance to qualify. I mean, I don't know enough about Ukraine, but clearly there's been immense corruption. Clearly there's a very delicate political situation there. If we can influence that towards a Western democratic model in opposition to, Soviet, uh, to well, what is effectively Soviet communism and so on, I think we should do. But we should be very careful because, you know, we've always assumed that there are rational players here I'm not sure how rational Putin is in these situations, and he still has an immense set of missiles available. But obviously, you know, like all dictators, he pushes and pushes, and if he gets his way there, he'll get his way perhaps somewhere, Finland, Latvia, elsewhere. Sure, I'm going to have to push you on now to talk about our next topic, and Edward Little will be jailed for at least 16 years after planning an act of terrorism on a Christian preacher at Speaker's Corner on September the 23rd, 2022. So the next topic I want to talk about, gentlemen, to start with you, Ed, mm. is Speaker's Corner. Speaker's Corner meant to be, historically, culturally, a global epicentre of the freedom to speak, but incidents like this, I think, highlight... Um, a worrying trend that it's no longer become a place where you can freely speak. And in particular, we have to say, there have been Muslims policing this area and attacking Christians. I put it to you that, that Speaker's Corner is becoming censored. So free speech is one of those absolutely mandatory non-negotiables, as far as I'm concerned. I think the law already goes too far on hate speech. I think, you know, I work for a, a think tank called the Centre for Social Justice, and for us to make change, we have to fundamentally, day by day, challenge every assumption in society. And that will mean saying offensive things, saying the wrong things, being challenged on it and moving forward. And the idea that we would censor that at Speaker's Corner, of all places, is profoundly concerning. Mm. And apart from anything else, there's this movement at the moment that sort of looks back at historical wrongs. You sort of look back, you know, at slave trade and what have you. Rightly, it was a historical wrong. I sit here every day thinking, 100 years from now, they're going to look at us and the historical wrongs we've done. What are they? And if we can't speak into society mm. at the moment in a bold and brave way as to what is going wrong, then 100 years from now, we won't be able to do that. We will still be doing slavery. Mm. We will still be doing those things that mm. we look back on now in the past. Roger, um, what's your take on this? Because undeniably, that there, have, there have been a few flashpoints at Speaker's Corner and there is an atmosphere of, of fear starting to envelop. People don't feel free to speak. They do feel often threatened there. They do. I'm a hardliner on this issue, exactly like you. You defend this absolutely. You defend it in the universities. You defend it elsewhere. I mean, you do have to ask questions such as, you know, with, with the police uh, having to monitor so many marches, the cost and so on, it might be that, you know, temporarily you might take speaker's corners out for, out for a particular moment or whatever, or if there was a very direct threat, but that could only be temporary. No, I, I think I'm a hardliner on this. You defend free speech, but, yeah, you, 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 you know, you've got to be careful about not to offend people unnecessarily, that old argument about don't shout fire in the theatre, you know, whatever. And you do have to be sensitive to people. I mean, for example, I think over, you know, what's going on in the Middle East and so on, and say the Jewish reaction to what's happened. Mm. I don't think it's possible for us non-Jews to understand the sort of trauma and that the fear. But it shouldn't stop us criticising, but it shouldn't make us more sensitive. So I think that, you know, it's free speech with sensitivity. But mm. on issues such as should speakers corner continue, absolutely, we can give that up. We've lost something essential about ourselves. I totally agree. Now, gents, got a final topic I'd like to go through, and that's this. Research suggests that only one in four companies expect their staff to be in the office full-time in the coming years. Isn't it time things started getting back to normal? Ed, do you think that since the pandemic, the kind of pyjama class, as it were, has got a bit used to working from home? Companies want to save money on offices, of course, but is it going too far? Yeah, I should declare an interest here that I am a recovering civil servant. I am only <laughs> six weeks clean. Uh, and this was a very big issue in the civil service at the moment. I think my feeling was, you know, occasionally working from home as a civil servant, I can see some benefits. You know, I didn't have to pay for or sit on a tube, which is pretty horrific. Uh, I saw my family more. There were obvious benefits to it. But I do really worry about the effect that it has on too many people getting isolated. I think one of the big pieces of work we've been doing for three years at the Centre for Social Justice is looking at the effect of lockdown on children. We found by going onto online schooling, 150,000 have never come back. Mm. And there will be people now who just, it does not suit them to work from home. They, they, they need the identity, they need the purpose, the, the reason to go into work, the relationships they built. And without that, actually, you do them a disservice. Rod, 
Yeah, I think that the thing to bear in mind also is the fact that for a lot of, I think, women in particular, working from home occasionally can be a big boon. It's not just, oh, is the plumber coming around to repair the central heating? <gasps> They're not here at 10 o'clock, what do you do? It is important things with the children and so on. So, actually, I welcome a greater degree of flexibility. But, I mean, I don't understand... Uh, how certain jobs can be done unless you're together. Mm. I mean, when I used to run an independent production company sometimes, uh, you come in the office and somebody wouldn't say something, but you'd, you'd detect an atmosphere over there or you'd see somebody who looks rather worried and then you would, you know, sit down and chat to them about what the problem was and whatever. If you're only seeing them on a screen, you probably wouldn't see them. Yeah. The other thing is, I find, for the sort of jobs I used to do, is that if you've got an absolute daft idea... You know, if I go for a drink with you afterwards in the pub and say, hey, listen, what do you think, why don't we try this? Mm. Um, 99 times it's stupid, one time it might be genius. Uh, if you don't have the interaction, I think it's a real problem. So I think that a blanket, uh, you know, view about this is wrong. But I, on the whole, I think more people should go back to the office for the reasons you stake. Also, and because there will be some malingerers, there yeah. always are. But, but leave a little bit of flexibility. But also, what about learning, you know, vicariously, you know, by osmosis. You, it's OK if you're already yeah. skilled mm. to sort of sit at home and have a latte. What about if yeah. you're young and coming through, you want to pick up skills from people around you? I'd say exactly that. It's very easy for someone mid-career with lots of contacts, good salary, nice home, to sit at home and do their thing and not worry about the future. For a new person starting on the job, it's that emotional intelligence, it's the soft mm. skills, the small p politics of an office. Mm. Who gets on with who? What does yeah. that look like? Mm. How do I make sure I get on in life? How can I make contacts? That really, really matters. And I think... Unfortunately, there are a lot of people in the sort of nice, comfortable middle positions making decisions that really don't serve the people at the start of their yeah, careers. Yeah. Yeah. Now, chaps, got one final topic before we wrap, and it's this. A Chinese entrepreneur has made hundreds of millions of pounds selling elf bars. They are disposable vapes which are available in hundreds of fruity flavours, and they've been very, very popular with underage children. So the question I want to put to you is, should these kinds of vapes be banned once and for all? Because they are clearly aimed at kids. They've got strawberries, bubblegum flavours, they're not even allowed to sell them in China and yet they are the, the, the rage amongst children and are they a pathway to addiction to nicotine? Well, they probably, yes, they probably are. And also there are figures recently which show that actually the decline in the number of people who've been smoking is going up, particularly among women. Uh, I'm with Richie Sunak on this, uh, Sunak on this when it comes to it. We should phase it out. And this idea, you know, nanny state intervening. Mm. If you look at the costs for all of us of people who, who do get into vaping, do get into smoking and then do get lung cancer, if you look at the people who eat too much and get diabetes and everything else, now we shouldn't condemn them, but we should say very clearly, you are going to cost the society an, an amazing mm. amount of money. S society and governments have the right to say, we intervene on this point. I'm afraid I'm a hardliner on this too. I'd ban it. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, Ed, we've got a minute left. What's your well, take on this? Not only am I a recovering civil servant, but I'm a recovering civil servant from the Department of Health. Uh, and so this is something I've been looking at quite a lot. And honestly, I feel I'm, I worry about over regulation mm. of, of adults' products. But when we're talking about targeting children, actually, yeah. we have a real responsibility there to actually make sure that what we are giving them is safe. And we don't know that vapes are safe. And if we are targeting these at children, we are knowingly putting them potentially in harm's way. And I think that's a very foolish road to go down. Yeah, and I, th I think, you know, Rishi Sunak seems quite, quite ban-happy at the moment. He also banned cigarettes, but he's, he's, he's staying away from this. I see kids around my, around my, my lad, he's 14, they're smoking these things on the streets willy-nilly. I think it's time to stop. Anyway, Ed Davis, thank you very much. Roger Bowen, thank you for joining us in the studio today in Westminster. Now, Rishi Sunak is preparing for crunch talks about the migrant crisis with the leaders of Italy and Albania. And I wonder, would he pick up any useful tips? Because Italy did a cracking deal with Albania about offshore containment, whereas we haven't got a single person yet to Rwanda. I'm Martin Dorby on GB News, Britain's News Channel. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, welcome to your latest GB News weather update from the Met Office. We'll stay cloudy and rather mild for many of us through the rest of the day, but overnight it does turn windier across the north as well as wetter too. That's because we've got this string of weather fronts out in the Atlantic. They'll continue to stream in wet weather across northern areas of the UK, particularly across for the far north of Scotland. Elsewhere, though, it will stay dry through the rest of the evening. We'll see some clear spells in the south and east, so it will feel a little bit cooler here, but elsewhere we've got a 
strong breeze and a southerly breeze and very mild air for the time of year. So it will be an exceptionally mild night tonight with temperatures not dipping much below 10 or 11 degrees for parts of Scotland. However, it will stay quite wet and windy across parts of Scotland throughout Saturday and into the afternoon. The rain will become quite heavy and persistent. Further south, though, it will stay dry once again through much of the day, but there will be quite a lot of cloud around. However, it's still staying very mild through Saturday and through much of the weekend as well, with highs of around 12 to 13 degrees across the UK, which is quite high for this time of year. However, the persistent rain across Scotland will continue through Saturday night and won't relent all the way through Sunday as well. So we do have an amber rain warning in force for parts of the Highlands and into the Ar Argyle as well. A yellow warning as well more widely. That rain will sink southwards into Monday and Tuesday to more southern areas of the UK, allowing cooler air to arrive in the north. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7pm. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. It reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? What is this? Is well, it, you... it, 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 you... <laughs> it's my new teeth. your new teeth. I, I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Carson, this Saturday night showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday night showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, it's five o'clock. I'm Martin Dorbney. Welcome to GB News, live from Westminster. 
Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is travelling to Italy for an immigration conference with right-wing leaders, but as Elon Musk makes a surprise appearance, I'll ask, is Rishi doing a Nick Clegg and gearing up for a Silicon Valley job after he loses the next general election? Piers Morgan says Prince Harry is on a mission to destroy the monarchy as the Duke of Sussex wins an historic £140,000 privacy case against the Mirror Group newspapers. And as police in Europe make seven arrests to stop Hamas attacks on Jewish targets, we ask, is the terror threat in the UK rising? Charlie Peters will bring us up to speed on that story. And remember, as ever, we want to hear from you. Please get in touch all with your opinions in all the usual ways. GBviews at gbnews.com. And we'll be reading out a few of the best ones later in the show. But first, here's your news with Sam Francis. Martin, thank you. Good afternoon. It's just gone uh, five o'clock. I'm Sam Francis in the GB Newsroom. Well... First to some breaking news. In the last hour, the woman who died in an explosion at Treforest Industrial Estate in South Wales has been named as 40-year-old Danielle Evans. We understand specialist officers are supporting her family. Police say there are no other reports of serious injuries, but the investigations into the cause of the explosion and the fire are continuing. We'll bring you more on that as we get it. Meanwhile, Prince Harry says it's a great day for truth and accountability after being awarded more than £140,000 in damages over phone hacking claims against a tabloid newspaper group. The High Court ruled there was extensive phone hacking by the Mirror Group newspapers between 2006 and 2011. In response, the publisher says they apologise unreservedly for any historical wrongdoing. The judge also said journalists were involved in phone hacking at the time Piers Morgan worked for the Daily Mirror. But the former editor claims he has never hacked a phone or told anyone else to hack a phone. As for him saying this is a good day for truth, the Duke has been repeatedly exposed in recent years as someone who wouldn't know the truth if it slapped him around his California tanned face. He demands accountability for the press but refuses to accept any for himself for smearing the royal family, his own family, as a bunch of callous racists without producing a shred of proof to support those disgraceful claims. Well, Piers Morgan's comments come in response to a statement that was made earlier by Prince Harry's lawyer. This case is not just about hacking. It is about a systemic practice of unlawful and appalling behaviour, followed by cover-ups and destruction of evidence, the shocking scale of which can only be revealed through these proceedings. The court has found that Mirror Group's principal board directors their legal department, senior executives and editors such as Piers Morgan clearly knew about or were involved in these illegal activities. A British schoolboy who went missing six years ago in France should be able to return to his family in the UK tomorrow. That's according to French officials who've been working with UK police on the situation. Alex Batty went missing in 2017 after going on a family holiday to Spain. Detectives believe that he was abducted by his mother to live an alternative lifestyle abroad. Here in the UK, police say there is no evidence of a third-party involvement after a body was found in a river during their search for a missing mother of three. Gaynor Lord went missing in Norwich last Friday with CCTV footage that was released by police showing her leaving work. Norfolk police say the body hasn't been formally identified, but her family have been notified. The force says it remains open-minded about the circumstances of the 55-year-old's disappearance and will continue to pursue all lines of inquiry. The Home Secretary says the government must and will do more after one person died in the English Channel. Another is still in a critical condition. A boat carrying migrants sank about five miles off the coast of Dunkirk overnight. More than 60 people were rescued. James Cleverley's described the incident as a horrific reminder of the people smugglers' brutality. And relatives of two people that were killed at a London music venue have renewed their appeal for information one year on from the fatal crush. 23-year-old security guard Gabby Hutchinson and 33-year-old Rebecca Aikumelo were killed when fans without tickets tried to force their way into the Brixton Academy. 
The Metropolitan Police have released CCTV images of people that they're looking to speak to about the incident. One person has been confirmed to be arrested. The parents of Rebecca say they want justice. We don't know what happened to her. We don't know how, how um, she died. And we're, we're, we're still waiting for, for information um, as to how this happened. And um, I mean, the most important thing is um, we don't want this to happen to another family. This is GB News across the UK on your TV, in your car, digital radio and on your smart speaker too. Now, though, more from Martin. And thank you, Sam. And we start with the latest on the migrant crisis. And I told you yesterday that Rishi Sunak will meet Italian Prime Minister Giorgio Maloney tomorrow. But in a major development, it's emerged that the leader of Albania will also be present. So I'm joined now in the studio by our political editor, Christopher Hope. So, Chris, this would seem like um, a good meeting of minds. Of course, Giorgio Maloney, um, the hardline Italian Premier, has made it a key mission of hers to stop the boat. So much so, she's done a deal with the Albanian Premier to build offshore containment centres, stopping the boats and taking them straight to Albania, where they will, will be processed in containment centres. Sounds like a great idea. Do you think Rishi Sunak will come back to Britain and do the same? Well, it's different to ours. Our, our idea, the UK government's idea, is a deportation plan to process people arriving here legally 5,000 miles away in Rwanda. It's so far away, rather than Albania, which is much comparatively nearer, it's meant to break the, the, the back of this business model, people pay desperate people pay for thousands of pounds to come, come across the, the channel to come here and then they're removed. Mm. That's the idea. We, we're hoping, the government hopes it might start in May. The Labour want to get rid of it. They think they don't like the idea of deportation. But offshore processing, which is what happened with Albania and Italy, is what uh, Germany are doing. And certainly I sensed that this week talking to Labour figures, that's where they may end up if Rwanda proves to be a success. Labour could adopt a similar policy mm. because currently putting up people who arrive here illegally in hotels is almost an invitation to come here, and that's not great. I spoke to a, a Labour MP in the week, and he said that Labour were looking at this idea. In fact, he name-checked Turkey and Greece. Now, I don't know if he had permission to do that or if he was riffing a bit, but that would be eminently sensible, surely, as an idea. Mm. Albania is a safe country, yep. Greece is a safe country, Turkey is. We could do a deal with those sorts of countries and have none of the yep. red well, tape and nightmares of Rwanda. We have a good deal w with Albania. With, um, Sunak, the PM, says he, he cut the number of crossings by 30% because of a deal with Albania. I would argue the bad weather also mm. contributed to enough falling numbers this year. So there is more talks with them and, yeah, it, it, it could work. I think this Rwanda idea, which is a kind of big bazooka attempt to, to, to break this business model, is what the government's behind. So far, 240 million quid's gone into it uh, with no actual apparent effect yet. And we're waiting mm. to see. But they are intent on flights taking off for mm. the first time in, in May. That link, though, but Maloney and Sunak, very interesting. They got together, the, the G20, very, they got, on, got well there. Both right-wing uh, leaders in continental Europe. Uh, I think UK sees Maloney as a way to sort of influence mm. EU um, policy. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say um, Rwanda's less of a bazooka, more of a pea shooter <laughs> at the moment. I digress. Correct. I want to talk about Elon Musk. Hovig interview. He was yes. he was around at Bletchley Park, of course. Seems to be a bit of a big tech bromance going on yes. between Rishi and Musk. And I, I'm, I'm going to be a cynic here and say Nick Clegg got himself a nice cushy job with big tech. Big tech at Facebook. Rishi has been angling to be a global forefront, a leader on AI. Elon Musk happens to agree with the same. Is this <laughs> Rishi Sunak polishing his CV on the world stage so he can have a nice cushy job with Musk after the You're general so election? cynical, Martin. I don't know. You've, you've been, <laughs> I've been around the block a bit as well. I mean, I don't think so. At <clears throat> the moment, AI is the growth, the growth industry. The UK is trying to be some form of regulator, set new international rules, be the place where people come to to work out what those guys rails are, to use the government's language on, on AI. Uh, AI is the growth market. Elon Musk, the, the guy who founded Tesla, he sends uh, SpaceX, he owns Twitter, uh, planes uh, into, into space, can we, uh, aircraft into space. So he, clearly, he is, that is a growth space, and, and he is close to Maloney as well. He's met Maloney also. So he feels he's got some common cause with these two leaders. I think, I know, of course, we know Sunak has his place in California, is he thinking about the future yet? I mean, oh, he would say he isn't. He wants to win the election next year, and let's take him at face value. Well, I admire your optimism. Thank you very much, Chris. <laughs> Hope. Always a pleasure.
Now, moving on, Prince Harry has been awarded more than £140,000 in damages after a phone hacking case. The Duke of Sussex took the action against Mirror Group newspapers and hailed today's ruling as a great day for truth as well as accountability. The judge also ruled that former editor of the Daily Mirror, Piers Morgan, both knew about and took part in phone hacking during his tenure at the paper. The broadcaster has, however, fiercely denied any claims he ever hacked a phone or indeed ordered anyone else to do so. The judgment finds there is just one article relating to the prince published in the Daily Mirror during my entire nine-year tenure as editor that he thinks may have involved some unlawful information gathering. To be clear, I had then, and still have, zero knowledge of how that particular story was gathered. All his other claims against the Daily Mirror, under my leadership, were rejected. With regard to the judge's other references to me in his judgment, I also want to reiterate, as I've consistently said for many years now, I've never hacked a phone or told anybody else to hack a phone. And nobody has produced any actual evidence to prove that I did. Well, the gloves are off once again between the Sussexes and Piers Morgan. And I'm joined now by Paul Conyu, who's the former editor of the Sunday Mirror. Paul, always a pleasure to speak to you. Um, a bad day for the Mirror Group. Um, they, were, they were found against, and the ramifications for the titles are, are robust. This is bad news. It's certainly bad news for a newspaper group that isn't doing too, doing too well at the moment, and I'm sure they'll be looking very carefully at the implications of the of the ruling um and i also think it'll be watched closely by uh, lawyers for both daily mail group and rupert murdoch's group too who are also facing uh, actions from prince harry scheduled to take place next year um prince harry certainly is a lot happier than the, than the mirror group today and uh, and I'm sure that I'm sure he may well react to Piers Morgan's reaction. So there's no love lost between those two. It's interesting, Paul, how during the statement that was read out, Piers Morgan was name checked. Of course, he denied um, taking part. He said, I've got zero knowledge of the story in question. Do you think the Sussexes and, and in particular Prince Harry may regret name checking Piers Morgan? Because Piers Morgan has come out with incendiary comments, including that the, Harry's real mission is to destroy the royal family, branding his own family callous racists without a shred of proof. It started as a good news day for Prince Harry. It's ended up a calamity. No, I don't really think so. Um, I mean, I'm not a cheerleader for Prince Harry. I have some sympathy with him, but I've also been a pretty robust criticism critic of him. But uh, but Piers is uh, amid the uh, predictably you know feisty response from Piers. It was a very carefully worded in one in one section. He said he had never hacked a phone. I totally believe that. I don't. You know, I think he probably ha has never personally hacked a phone. But the judge said that it, it was impossible, in his view, that editors uh, uh, would not know what, what was happening, which is, of course, and he also made the same, uh, the same charge against both the former uh, legal director and, a, and the former CEO. Now... But also, a thing that Piers didn't mention, uh, of course, was back in 2015, when the Mirror Group paid out, I think, about £1.3 million to a number of celebrities, including Paul Gascoigne um, and Sadie Frost, and among others, which they settled at the steps of the court, out of court, out, without it going to trial, they actually, their, their own QC at the time, got up and acknowledged that hacking had gone on on an industrial scale and that editors, and Piers Morgan was an editor at that, at that, at that time, knew about, knew about it. So that's back in 2015. And of course, Lord Leveson at the inquiry there was somewhat somewhat sceptical, shall we say, in his comments about Piers Morgan's evidence. Now, I've got no personal, you know, grudge against Piers at all, you know, and um, we've never worked together. We've worked not in opposition, but and he's a 
he can be a very, very good journalist. But but there are questions there which he didn't really address and uh, in that robust statement. But he, it was more about a personal attack on, you know, on, uh, on Prince Harry and his motivation rather than addressing spe specifically the details of, of the case. And, Paul, um, briefly, if we could, you mentioned at the top there that the Mirror Group is already in perilous times. It's not a good time for newspapers, period. Do you think this will um, be a terrible bad um, day for their, their reputation, their, their share price and, indeed, their future? Well, of course, the share price will be interesting. Um, how investors react will be will be quite interesting. The Mirror Group have just sacked a lot of journalists, sadly, because you know for financial for financial reasons. But I, I think it'd be, a, it'd be a tragedy if the Mirror Group went to the wall, and I hope and, and I hope it, it it wouldn't. But of course, what's going to happen here, though, Martin, is, is we're going to have now a revival of political pressure. Um, to reopen either criminal investigations or certainly a parliamentary investigation. Now, I'm somebody who who doesn't support Prince Harry in any means when he's when he's in any way encouraging uh, politicians to get involved in press regulation. Self regulation is still the best is the, still the best way, and I and I think that things have improved. Now, I. I predate, in fact, the hacking era, but I recently was the co-author of a book called Reporting Royalty, which looked, which looked at the Prince Harry case and also the general relationship between the media and the monarchy. And what will be interesting is whether this widens or, or maybe partly or maybe partly or maybe partly heals the rift between Prince Harry, his brother and his father. OK, we have to leave it there. Paul Conyou, former editor of the Sunday Mirror. Don't forget, Leveson did for the News of the World. Let's see what the Harry ruling does for the Mirror Group. You get lots more on Prince Harry on our website. And thanks to you, GBNews.com is the fastest-growing national news website in the country. It's got breaking news and all the brilliant analysis you've come to expect from GB News. Now, you could start your new year with £10,000 in cash, a 500 quid shopping spree and a brand new iPhone. Sounds sweet, right? Well, here's how you could make all of those prizes yours. This is your chance to win cash, treats and tech in our very first Great British giveaway. There's a totally tax-free £10,000 cash up for grabs. Cash, which would help make 2024 a whole lot better. We're also going to send you shopping with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. What would be on your shopping list? If it's a new iPhone, we've also got that covered too with the latest iPhone 15 Pro Max, which you'll also receive. For your chance to win the iPhone, the vouchers and £10,000 cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB01, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 5th of January. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Good luck. Now, GB News has sat down with the mother of, mother of murdered toddler James Bulger. Denise Fergus spoke of her work to overhaul the UK's parole system. If Venable does get out, these people who are saying, you know, let it go, if you went and killed one of their kids, they'd be saying to me, you should have fought harder. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. <laughs> Second best. Smile at me, Steamer. You interviewed Adam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. 
I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back, it's 5.22. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, later this hour, we'll discuss the news that four suspected Hamas members have been arrested in Europe. Now, the mother of murdered toddler James Bulger has warned parents that their children will never be safe if the parole system isn't overhauled. One of James's killers, John Venables, was denied freedom by the parole board this week after a 30-year fight to keep him behind bars. Denise Fergus sat down with GB News presenter Eamon Holmes. Denise says she has finally got to justice for her, for her son, but Venables could appeal and get another parole hearing within two years. He was taken just two weeks shy of his third birthday. So I can see him in the lads that I've got now, you know, because they all look so similar. You know, the last thing he asked for when I asked him what he wanted for his birthday was a birthday cake. He didn't get that birthday cake. But you'd love the chance to give him a birthday cake. Gotcha. On his birthday, when he was first taken, I did place a birthday cake on his resting place, but, you know, it, it, it should have been in front of his face. On the 12th of February, 1993, Robert Thompson and John Venables kidnapped, tortured and killed two-year-old James Bulger in Liverpool. It was one of the most shocking crimes in modern British history. The toddler's murderers were both just 10 years old. A lot of people will know what has happened to James, but they don't really know. They don't really know the detail. They don't really know what was in Venables and Thompson's head and what motivated them and what made them the way they were. What, what do you think this tells us about society, about what's available online, about grooming? What, what's the lesson well, to be learned? There's a lot now that, you know, kids can learn through, you know, social media and stuff like that. But there was nothing like that back then. There was no mobile phones or not. And so, you know, just taking that out of the, you know, the question, it's just pure evilness on their behalf. How sick are they? Were they? I can't call them sick because there's sick people out there who need doctors and nurses. They don't, they just, they don't deserve anyone's time. You know, what they did 
they took a baby's life and destroyed his family's lives in the, the proceeds of it. And they didn't just take his life, they tortured him. Yeah. That's, that's... In the most horrendous way that they could have taken a child. You see, that's the bit that I find really difficult. There could have been an accident, they could have pushed him over, there could have been something that went wrong and he hit his head, but they didn't. They, they dwelt on this for a long time. The plans to do that, what they done, uh, they tried to abduct a, a kid two weeks before. So, you know, if they took that kid two, two weeks before, James is still being here, no doubt. But, you know, they carefully planned that. It was premeditated. So they knew that they were going out that day to take a, a child's life. John Venables was released on licence in 2001, but recalled to prison nine years later after indecent images of children were found on his computer. He was again released in 2013, only to be put behind bars again for the same offence. This time, the parole board were taking no chances. Denise, when you got the phone call yesterday to say that Venables was not being released, how did that feel? I was kind of numb. I, I think I, st I still am in a state of shock because after 30 years, I finally feel like I'm getting listened to now and everything that I've said in the past, you know, it, it's wrong true because I did say if the two of them weren't properly punished for the crime that they committed, they only spent just over seven years in a, a young offenders. They never went to an adult prison. And I did say if they don't spend any time in a, a proper jail, either one or both of them will go on to re-offend and commit more crimes. And I was proven right with, with Venables. Where do we go from here, Denise? Venables is, is detained again, but it could only be for maybe for two years. You might have to go through all of this again. You know, I've come 30 years fighting justice for James and, you know, I'll do it for as long as I need to, to do it or as long as I can do it. Um, until I get the proper justice, I feel like I've got some kinds of justice for him now because he's been denied parole. And, you know, I am getting the backings of, you know, some MPs now, Dominic Robb and... Uh, Alex Chalk, you know, what they've been saying to me, they've stood by their words and, you know, they, they, they've helped me get some kinds of justice, which I've never had before. The government is pushing through an overhaul of the parole system, with new laws allowing ministers to block the release of the most dangerous criminals. It just feels like now I'm, I'm just getting support from, you know, the, the MPs, because this is the first time I've got to, actually got to, to meet, meet them and... You know, they've stuck to what they've told me. Yeah. What would you say, Denise, to people? This is not me saying this, but I know there will be people watching and listening to us and say, for goodness sake, Venables and Thompson were 10 years old at the time. They were, they were babies themselves. Well, how can you keep going on punishing them? One of them needs punishing because he's behind bars again. If Venables gets out, let's make him an example. If he gets out, these people who were saying, well, he would only 10, you know, you know, it's been 30 years now, let it go. Why should I? One, he was my son. He, he's not here to speak for himself, so I'm doing it for him. And two, if Venables does get out, these people who were saying, you know, let it go, if he went and killed one of their kids, they'd be saying to me, you should have fought harder. Yes. I mean, I know you, you've become, another, you know, you've got another grandchild now. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. I see pictures of you with your grandchildren. I can't do that. Where are you at, Denise? If I was to ask you now, here we are in 2023, we're heading into Christmas. What state are you in? I'm not in any state. I'm in a good place. I've got, you know, my husband's, me three boys. I've got my family, my granddaughter. You know, I'm, I'm in a happy place. The only time I'm not is when something like this occurs and I've got to take on another fight, but it's my choice and I'll carry on doing it. Do you live for James? I live for my lads, all, all of my lads. So you're not going to be simply defined by this one horrible aspect of your life? No, because I'm two pe I, th I think I'm two people. Um, I'm a mum, but I'm also a campaigner. And, you know, for as long as I've got breath in me, I will carry on campaigning to get justice, not just for me, but for anyone who needs it out there. And for people who will say a prayer for you this Christmas, what would you say to them? I'd say, say a prayer for James. 
say a prayer for Venables and Thompson? No. no. Why not? They don't need prayers. To people who say they need understanding, they need forgiveness. They, they, they basically did get forgiveness, but one chose, he didn't want that forgiveness and carries on doing what he wants to do. He's not just a child murderer, he's also a paedophile. So they don't deserve any good. They've been given too many chances, especially Venables. You know, he's been given chance after chance, new rehabilitation, new names, this, that, and you know, the loads of money spent on him. You know, he didn't deserve that, but he got it. And look where he's ended up, back in prison. Is there anything, anything at all Venables could do that would lift him in terms of your estimation? Yeah, he can stay in prison. Moving interview. Superb. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and six o'clock, and I'll discuss the extraordinary story of the missing British teenager who was abducted by his mother and grandfather in 2017. He'll be reunited with his family tomorrow. Astonishing story. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Sam Francis. Martin, thank you. Good afternoon. It's just gone half past five. The headlines this hour, tributes have been paid to a woman who died in an explosion in South Wales. 40-year-old Danielle Evans has been described as a whirlwind of a woman by her family who said she would be deeply missed. Police say there are no other reports of serious injuries, but their investigations into the cause of the incident at Treforest Industrial Estate are continuing. Prince Harry says it's a great day for truth and accountability after being awarded more than £140,000 in damages over phone hacking claims against a tabloid newspaper group. The High Court ruled there was extensive phone hacking by the Mirror Group newspapers between 2006 and 2011. In response, the publisher says they do apologise unreservedly for any historical wrongdoing. The judge also said journalists were involved in phone hacking at the time Piers Morgan worked for the Daily Mirror. The former editor claims he has never hacked a phone or told anyone else to hack a phone. As for him saying this is a good day for truth, the Duke has been repeatedly exposed in recent years as someone who wouldn't know the truth if it slapped him around his California tanned face. He demands accountability for the press but refuses to accept any for himself for smearing the royal family, his own family, as a bunch of callous racists without producing a shred of proof to support those disgraceful claims. A British schoolboy who went missing six years ago in France should be able to return to his family in the UK tomorrow. That's according to French officials who've been working with UK police on the situation. Alex Batty, who's now 17, went missing in 2017 after going on a family holiday to Spain. Detectives believe he was abducted by his mother to live an alternative lifestyle abroad. Here in the UK, police say there is no evidence of third-party involvement after a body was found in a river during their search for a missing mother of three. Gaynor Lord went missing in Norwich last Friday. CCTV footage was released showing her leaving work. Norfolk police say the body hasn't been formally identified, but her family have been informed. The force says it remains open-minded about the circumstances of the 55-year-old's disappearance and will continue to pursue all lines of inquiry. Well, you can get more on all of those stories by visiting our website, gbnews.com. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2715 and €1.1651. Euros. The price of gold is £1,600.02 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 has closed the day at 7,576 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report.
Thank you, Sam. Now, on to a truly astonishing story, and that's the missing teenager, the British teenager who was abducted by his mother and grandfather in 2017, will be reunited with his family tomorrow. Alex Batty, who's now 17, was only 11 years old when he disappeared. French prosecutors say that for the past six years, he'd been living a life with no connection to the real world. Alex was found after he'd been walking for four days, having decided to escape when his mum told him they were moving from the Pyrenees Mountains to Finland. Well, joining us now is former detective superintendent Shabnam Chowdhury. Thanks for joining us on the show. A truly astonishing story and one that um, just fills every parent filled with hope. But in terms of the policing of this, this is totally unique. Uh, absolutely. And, and what good news that, um, you know, he's a child, he's 17 years of age, um, has been found safe and well. Um, but it will be a unique investigation for the police here in the UK. By now, they would already have appointed a, a team of investigators. Within that, they'll include specialist investigators. There will be specialist officers who will have skills and training around debriefing and interviewing Alex to ensure that he is safe and well, that there's no criminal allegations that come out of this or that there have been no criminal acts. Whilst he's been with family for the last six years, remember, um, he was pretty much abducted by his parents. He's been to three countries, Morocco, to Spain and to France, um, and it's believed he's been in communes. And listen to the uh, French prosecutors earlier on with some of the comments that they made, but uh, Alex needs to be fully debriefed and also to make sure that he is um, mentally in a good place as well. Well, Shabnam, the, the story of the French delivery driver who picked him up um, when he was wandering around the mountains and then um, he, even off, he even helped deliver pharmaceuticals and apparently he wasn't hungry, he wasn't thirsty, he seemed quite well, he had money. It's, it's a simply staggering story and one that sort of really puts faith back in humanity. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really good that he was found in the way that he was found. I mean, he'd been wandering for four days. He'd seen signs for Toulouse and was hoping that he'd find uh, some help from there. Uh, but as I say, the investigators for here, because it's a British investigation, as I understand it, they will go and they will debrief the witnesses. They will go back and they'll do a very detailed and thorough investigation um, to ensure that there aren't any criminal allegations. The fact is that uh, prosecutors from France have made some very uh, interesting comments today. They need to be looked into. This isn't going to be something where um, Alex is spoken to over the next couple of days and the police will be very happy with everything that's gone on. This is six years of his life that have not been accounted for. Uh, he's been off the grid, so to speak, because he's probably not had uh, uh, the kind of education that he should have had, and certainly one that he should have had here in the UK. So they'll be looking very carefully into this, and they'll, they'll make decisions as to how they'll proceed forward. And Shadnam, as well as the um, dramatic and emotional reunion that we all see, and as well as the well-being of the child, that's obviously paramount, will British police, do you think, be pushing for a prosecution of the mother, trying to apprehend her and charge her with any crimes? Well, they will work very carefully and uh, closely with um, the French authorities because you've got to remember there may be some areas of child neglect here and that needs to be looked into in more detail. And that's why they'll have specially trained officers, officers who um, have a vast experience in safeguarding in child uh, care cases and child abuse, child neglect, all of those um, areas that they will investigate. And quite possibly there may be some uh, prosecutions coming forward. But again, because he's in different authorities, He's in Morocco, he's in Spain, he's in uh, France. So they've got to debrief all those particular areas. They've got to locate actually where he was in the first instance to actually establish what time of a type of an environment he was actually living in. Did they have food? Did they have good clothing? Were the people around them very good? He's got to consider any potential other people that were involved in uh, the, the care of Alex and whether they were also looking after him in the way that they should have done and whether there are any witnesses out there that would say otherwise to what the parents might say. OK, former Detective Superintendent Shavon Chowdhury, thank you very much for joining us um, and talking on the case of Alex Batty. Truly just feels like some sort of miracle before Christmas. Now, there's a warning today that the UK faces a period of heightened risk of terrorism. 
I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Pretty mouth. OK. Here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's News Channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? It, 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 you... <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's on your teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Now to a warning that the UK is facing a period of heightened risk after a Hamas plot to murder Jews in Europe was disrupted there by intelligence agencies. Three people were arrested in Denmark, three in Germany and another in the Netherlands. German officials revealed that four of the seven suspects are indeed members of Hamas. Well, I'm joined now by our reporter, Charlie Peters. So, Charlie, a successful series of stings on the continent, but the question we must ask is, is the risk of a terror attack by Hamas operatives against Jewish targets in the UK an increased possibility? Well, that's what security sources and experts were warning GB News this morning, that we are at a heightened risk after these revelations from Europe. This is a significant update in Hamas tactics and procedures. This would be briefed as vital intelligence in the European security agencies and almost certainly in Britain as well. Vital intelligence typically considered to be a new threat to life or a change in tactics by a terrorist organisation. And this is exactly what that is because usually 
Hamas operates in Israel and the West Bank and in Gaza. But now we're seeing the terrorist organization reportedly operating in Central Europe. Last night, the German prosecutor saying that they were attempting to move a set of weapons to Berlin to target Jewish institutions, really setting forward a plan for the terrorist organization there, foiled last night by German intelligence. Three arrested there, another arrested in Rotterdam by Dutch authorities on advice from the Germans. And also we've heard about three arrests in Denmark last night as well. Less information available about the Danish threat understood at this stage to not be linked to Hamas because the Danish intelligence agency not releasing more information there. We also understand that the Israeli intelligence agencies, Mossad and Shin Bet, were involved in this operation and they said today that they are expanding their work in Europe and elsewhere to tackle a growing and new Hamas threat on the continent. But could the same thing be happening in Britain? Well, last month we did hear from security sources at GB News that a terror attack linked to the Gaza crisis was only a matter of time. And our uh, home affairs and security correspondent, Mark White, met with members of the police who were on vigilance patrols throughout the country to reassure the population at this time, as the threat is considered to be significant. But as we understand, no uh, clear threat at this point on the UK from Hamas. But as we said, this changing of tactics and procedures in Europe is a significant and major upgrade on Hamas capabilities. OK, Charlie Peters, thank you for that update. And I'm joined now in our studio by our political editor, Chris Verhope. Chris, on the political front, this has posed a huge headache for the, how we police yeah. such matters in the UK, particularly um, Suella Bravman was calling um, the pro-Palestine marchers hate marchers. Do you think that helped that kind of febrile political environment or is a calmer approach, a better way of doing it? I think it didn't help. I think Philip Raymond's calling it a hate march. I mean, there were some elements of hate around those marches. We saw those obviously on social media and on GB News. Um, but I think generally it was mo mostly people trying to raise awareness of the issue in Palestine. I think when politicians get involved, they can make it worse. I mean, just, just this week, though, the government is putting pressure on Hamas. M Mahmoud Zahar, the Hamas's co-founder, has been sanctioned by the UK government this week. They are trying to put some democratic, some diplomatic pressure on Hamas, making sure that the terror group does feel the pressure of, of, of our international uh, real concern about their behaviour with that, their awful massacre last in October. October. That's the guy who got cut price council house in Brent, isn't it? And, and a lot of people think he sh people like him should be deported. Well, well, the, the, the mood music has changed on Hamas, as it did after the Al-Qaeda attacks, when it looked like the, the West had to, to take a firmer action than they had done in the past, and it's, it's, to, be, it's to, be, to be be praised. It just feels to me, just anecdotally, that London has calmed down. I think ahead of the Remembrance Sunday um, mm. uh, commemorations, it felt really tense around Whitehall, mm. less so now, but, you, but that is, there's no reason to say that wasn't mean something bad might happen, so it's a real risky time at the moment. But we speak often, we saw a report yesterday um, of an eight 80% of British Jews are afraid. Yeah. They think things have drastically changed since October the 7th. How in tune are politicians about that? I think with, with, with the Jewish community, it is understood, in, it definitely understood. There was more money, millions of pounds, put in, into it by Rishi Sunak to, to protect Je Jewish uh, pla places of faith and worship. And it's vital because they are feeling very, very vulnerable. They're looking at their social media, wondering why... People don't appear to be that sympathetic to the, to the to Jews. It's not, not, not fair, and they're concerned about it. OK, Chris Hope, thanks for your input. Now, a Chinese entrepreneur has made hundreds of millions of pounds selling disposable vapes, and they're available in hundreds of flavours and have proved very popular with underage children. Joining me now is John Dicey, who's the CEO of the senior therapist of Alan Carr's Easy Way Worldwide. Thank you for joining me on the show, John. These Elf Bar um, vapes, they come in bubblegum flavour, candy floss flavour, watermelon flavour. The guy who markets them has made billions of pounds globally, and yet the products he sells are banned in his native China. Should we do the same here and ban them in Britain? It's interesting. It's one of those um, ind industries that has been proven to be um, untrustworthy, dishonest. So uh, going back a few years, you had Jewel um, in the USA, was fined uh, half a billion dollars for um, 
illegally targeting kids with the products um, under the guise of helping smokers quit smoking. And um, health bars uh, similarly have uh, been proven to uh, put illegal levels of nicotine in devices that are sold in the UK, um, often to kids. Um, so I think consideration has to be given to this. I think the harm reduction uh, objectives of vaping are well known, um, the idea being that uh, it's less harmful for smokers. Um, but we need to really focus our attention on protecting children uh, from getting drawn into um, the vaping trap, um, which has been inevitable really over the last 10 years at Alan Carr, we've been warning about it um, because the, we used to be worried about big tobacco. Now we have big nicotine, um, these massive vaping companies, Elf Bar, for example. I think they make up something like 75% of the disposable vape industry in the UK. So they have incredible influence. Um, so serious regulation needs to be applied. And John, of course, when vapes first came out, they were lauded as a pathway out of smoking and therefore a good thing. But now we're seeing something quite different, and that is vapes being marketed at young people in clearly, you know, the kind of flavours they like, the colours they like, they're cheap, they're disposable, a pathway into addiction. And therefore, surely the legislation around this needs to be updated. Yeah, we've been calling for this for over 10 years. It's entirely predictable. When you look at the uh, Big Tobacco playbook over the years, um, we saw this coming uh, from a long way off. Um, so it's a little bit like sort of um, uh, locking the stable door after the horse has bolted. Um, but certainly something needs to be done about it. Um, long overdue. Rishi Sunak, of course, has waged war on actual cigarettes. He wants there to be a generation smoke-free moving forward. But is it, is it possible to stop the sale of these vapes now? I mean, you can buy them at car boot sales, you can buy them anywhere, you can buy them at most corner shops, and they're very lucrative for the retailers because, of course, they have a one-shot, one-use, and they get chucked away, which in itself poses a recycling issue. My question is, it might sound good to stamp our feet and say these should be banned, but actually... Is it just too late? Is that not possible? It's difficult, isn't it? Prohibition generally is proven mm. not to work. I think we can focus on education. I think once these kids... Kids are, are realising very quickly after they start vaping that they're addicted. So we have inundated the inquiries about um, how to help them get free. We're actually launching a new video programme specifically for youngsters um, in the new year. Um, and we uh, endless number of um, adults hooked on vaping, attending our live seminars across the UK. So really, it's two things, educating youngsters to, to avoid uh, the nicotine trap, um, legislation um, uh, to, to assist that, I think, but also providing um, access to help. Um, currently, for example, look on the NHS website for help to quit vaping. There isn't any. Um, in fact, all you get on the NHS website is how to, how to switch to vaping from cigarettes. OK, thank you very much, John Dice. We're going, going to have to leave it there. Thanks for joining us on the show. Now, standing in tonight for Michelle Jubilee, it's Bev Turner. Bev, what's on your menu? Good evening, Martin. Look at, can I just say, you're looking very dapper in our lovely new studios there in Westminster. I'm very jealous that you've got to see them before me. Uh, we've got a packed show coming up. We're going to be talking about Prince Harry with his hacking case. I was hacked. I could have had a few hundred thousand pounds today, but I chose not to take it to court, and I will tell you uh, why. We're also talking about anti-Semitism. How bad is it in the UK now? How do we bring people together uh, rather than seeing them fighting on the streets? American Airlines, there's an American airline that is now giving free airline seats to passengers who are obese. So if you're fat, you don't get one seat, you get two. And how does what does that mean for how we feel about being larger bodied today? And Weight Watchers are now offering a diet plan for those people who are on weight loss injections. So who is, whose responsibility is it if there is little too much of you to love? And also, Richie Sunak talking about the fact that there might be an inquiry in the new year into whether the under 16s should be allowed social media at Great stuff. all, or should we ban it? OK, Bev, we have to leave it there. Thank you very much. I've been Martin Dorby. Stay tuned for Jubes & Co with Bev Turner. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather 
on GB News. Hello, welcome to your latest GB News weather update from the Met Office. We'll stay cloudy and rather mild for many of us through the rest of the day, but overnight it does turn windier across the north as well as wetter too. That's because we've got this string of weather fronts out in the Atlantic. They'll continue to stream in wet weather across northern areas of the UK, particularly across for the far north of Scotland. Elsewhere, though, it will stay dry through the rest of the evening. We'll see some clear spells in the south and east, so it will feel a little bit cooler here, but elsewhere we've got a a strong breeze and a southerly breeze and very mild air for the time of year so it will be an exceptionally mild night tonight with temperatures not dipping that much below 10 or 11 degrees for parts of Scotland however it will stay quite wet and windy across parts of Scotland throughout Saturday and into the afternoon the rain will become quite heavy and persistent further south though it will stay dry once again through much of the day but there will be quite a lot of cloud around However, it's still staying very mild through Saturday and through much of the weekend as well, with highs of around 12 to 13 degrees across the UK, which is quite high for this time of year. However, the persistent rain across Scotland will continue through Saturday night and won't relent all the way through Sunday as well. So we do have an amber rain warning in force for parts of the Highlands and into the Ar Argyll as well. A yellow warning as well more widely. That rain will sink southwards into Monday and Tuesday to more southern areas of the UK, allowing cooler air to arrive in the north. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB